smell in here is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> These two pieces of wood are similarly matched. Wow! Our old facility really was finished being built. This place is just... So, okay, look at that, you can tell it's autumn now. There yes. go the geese flying into the oh. beautiful blue Nazareth sky. You can't see that. <laughs> Taylor's desperately going to try and get a shot now. Oh. There they are in formation. Flying south for the winter. Uh, absolutely. That's what we should be doing. Um, if you look over my shoulder here, you will see a building that looks remarkably similar to the one that we've just left. You were saying that when you built this, there was an attempt to try and almost create a replica, right? So when we actually built the museum, so when, when we came in 1964 to build this property, this, this building probably would have been about maybe 50% of the size it is right now. So you can see we're kind of in a residential neighborhood. We've expanded this building as much as we possibly could for guitar construction. But Chris was very adamant many years ago about properly celebrating the company's history and with so many people coming here for tours to watch how we built guitars he elected to build this museum it was a massive investment for us i know there was a lot of questions at the time if we would get a payback for it but chris pushed it through and as far as i'm concerned it's one of the greatest tools we have people come every summer to take a look at it and it's built in the spirit of the old mountain it's, factory Lee, it is right? beautiful and you were saying also and this is Ramin by the way yes. Ramin's uh, we met uh, you, if you go back about four years ago to some <laughs> nat and videos you'll see Ramin taking us around the, the Martin stand there so it's great to see you again Likewise, haven't seen nice you for to a see while you guys been too long um, and Carmen you were saying that again up in the sort of just slightly up yep. the hill there Cherry Hill yep um, that was where uh, the original yep Martin that would be that would be the original location coming from Hudson Street, New York. So right. he would be up there for a period of time before he would purchase eight acres of land. He would be allowed to be purchased in the town of Nazareth in mm -hmm. 1857. And then about 1859 is when you would see the factory completed in construction and actually producing guitars. Well, let's head on in. Um, take a moment to admire this super cool kind of pathway as we go in. The whole lobby is, uh, is sort of like uh, has design features that evoke the acoustic guitar. So right. all the way from the peg head, when we go in, you'll see even more of this. Oh, cool. The fretboard. <laughs> this was the 75 fret edition. <laughs> it's a <laughs> microtonal guitar. Yeah. Oh, I see, right, so look at the way that all the um, floor tiles have been laid to make the big acoustic guitar. Oh, and yeah, mirrored in the ceiling as well. Mirrored ceilings, it's a big favorite. <laughs> <laughs> There's Mitch. Mitch is the second most senior person in the entire company after Chris Martin, and he's delivering coffee to us. That's literally how important we are. I said, I don't want... <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to Martin. Thank you so much. Look at that. What's the story? I know we're going to go into cars rather than guitars, but what's the story? So if you come over here and take a look at the, the brand on the side, it's Paul Jr. Design. So this would be a collaboration we did with American Choppers. So right. Chris was always uh, enamored, really liked the whole theme of that uh, when it was popular with the television series. So we did a, a program with them. If you look it up, uh, we actually have an episode with the Tuttles where we built a guitar for Pauly Jr. And Pauly Jr. so uh, nicely built us this piece. Um, and when we received it, actually, we got it in the sawmill and we had our local neighbor uh, Formula One driver champion Mario Andretti drive it right down in for us. So it was quite a quite a neat thing for us to so do. So Mario Andretti lives near here as well. Yeah, he? he actually lives right up right up the street here. So maybe we're yeah, going. He's a big part of Nazareth history. I bet. Yep. These days, uh, Santa Claus drives the trike yep. uh, a few times a year. You know, we'll have like uh, parties for that. for big events and Christmas time is when Santa, so any like long white hairs in there, that's the uh, essence this, of Santa so Claus. Is this a road legal car? Yeah. yeah. Yep. That is epic. Why aren't we taking this out for the day, Tay? <laughs> well, look, what are we doing first? We're doing the museum or the factory? Factory. Or factory first. Yep. Okay. Yep. This is where it all starts, I suppose, in, in any guitar manufacturing facility. 
Uh, it's where the raw materials arrive, so predominantly timber. The smell in here is fantastic. Uh, it's what we need. I wish, I wish you could smell this, but I mean, there's a lot of wood here. So tell us, you know, where's it coming from? How much of it comes in pre-cut? All that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So we source wood um, uh, uh, lumber from all over the world. Uh, basically, uh, all the species that we use uh, to combine, you know, the, the tonal elements, the visual elements, we have to get them from wherever they are uh, endemic, where they naturally grow. Yep. And so, uh, through those giant uh, garage doors over there, shipments of timber and lumber arrive on a daily basis. Uh, we have a few other storage facilities around town as well, but mostly when the rubber meets the road, this is where things are coming in to begin the process of making a guitar. So, uh, just here where we're standing, uh, we have uh, spruce from Alaska, we have uh, rose or sapili um, from uh, various African nations, we have billets of rosewood over there, and some of the relationships with these vendors have been decades and decades, generations in the making. So, for example, our rosewood, uh, we mostly source from the Yogi family, they're in India, they ship it to us uh, in burlap bags, and, uh, and we begin the, the processing. We have mahogany um, from South American oh. countries and Central America. And here you can see uh, some beautiful uh, burlap, uh, original packaging, <laughs> straight from the yogis. And, uh, and these relationships are really uh, special. So routinely we'll have our wood purchasing uh, group um, and, and other uh, logistics folks physically go visit uh, all the places that these woods come from, far-flung places, and some of the stories that our wood buyer, Mike Dickinson, has from his travels around the planet looking for the best tone woods are incredible. That would be worth a whole series by itself, honestly. Um, but here you can see we have... Um, that's what you need, the Discovery Channel, if you're yeah. listening. <laughs> that's what you need to do, go and follow these guys around where they go and find all the, the, all the wood from. Yes. That would be cool. Uh, it's like finding Bigfoot, except we actually find this stuff. <laughs> um, we got uh, mahogany here, and you can see that uh, these uh, have been re-sawn, but this was all uh, one big board, and it's been re-sawn into smaller pieces, and uh, these uh, quite clearly are going to become the sides um, yeah. of instruments. Uh, so I but, suppose unlike, um, unlike the electric guitar factories that we've been, you, you don't have, a, apart from maybe neck billets, you don't have a lot of use for pieces of timber that are maybe two inches thick. That's so true. Ev everything's got to be um, cut to a pretty thin precision, right? And then bent into shape and... Absolutely. Now we used to resaw uh, most of our wood. We still resaw some percentage of it. Um, so that's still a skill set that we keep and you know an ability we like to have because to your point, um, when wood uh, is available, it's not, not always an option for us mm. to, to dictate exactly what the yeah. dimensions are that it comes in. Sometimes we have to you know, we have to take it and, and work with it um, in whatever form it's available to us. So um, does it sit here and kind of acclimatize for a bit or is it straight into a drying process or what, what's, what happens So next? we do acclimate wood uh, in a variety of ways. Um, we test all the wood that comes in to make sure that it's at proper uh, dryness levels. Uh, oftentimes when, when wood comes in what we call a little bit green or a little bit wet, um, we will put it in a, one of our various kilns over there and we will dry it. Some of our suppliers have kilns of their own, and that's an investment as well in, in some cases that we've made in their um, you know, local areas to actually get the kiln uh, set up so that they can send us timber that's already been acclimated to some degree. And once the wood, um, so you see these, these wood pieces are unprocessed. They come in, they're all stacked together, you know, packed very densely like sardines, right? And this is a great way to ship wood. Yep. But when you're actually acclimating wood, you need to have airflow yeah, between all the pieces. And so if you there. look at this here, this is wood, uh, this is what we would call on sticks. Mm -hmm. And this is to ensure that uh, the airflow can go through um, between and among all the pieces. It reduces the risk of warpage and helps get a more consistent, uh, consistent drying level. Because as you can imagine, it's a not piece of dry wood like this, from the center of no. something like yeah. this exactly is not gonna acclimate um, to the same degree as one where there's free flowing ambient humidity. One other note too, if you see these purple papers hanging all over, this is basically tracking documentation. So we could go back, we know where the wood was sourced from, all the proper paperwork, everything is coming in 
as legal. Just as Ramin pointed out, a lot of sustainability, the certified uh, cedar program we have, but even little things like this, it says, yeah. You know, we have a waste reduction program, so we're constantly looking at that, quality checks. Um, this is where all the stuff gets received into the factory well, it's, room. It, it's, I remember um, Diane, have you, have you seen Diane at all, Diane Ponzio? Yeah, last, I mean, I, I, know she I retired haven't talked a few to her in a ago, while, but we're always in touch, but and she's living her life I, in New Zealand. I, I remember Diane saying to me, you know, one of the biggest um, worries that, that Chris Martin had was that, you know, if, if the whole supply chain of timber, you know, obviously guitars is a tiny bit, but if the, if the whole supply chain isn't responsible about where we're sourcing timber from, how we're using it, it will just run out. Yeah, yes. You know, obviously catastrophic environmental implications of that. One tiny offshoot will be, we won't be able to make guitars out of wood anymore. But yeah, being responsible about where the wood comes from, making sure that it's sustainable, so it's th so these, important. These purple tags um, are kind of special to Carmen's point. We, you know, we have uh, maintained chain of custody documentation for all the wood that we purchase. However, certain certification bodies have even more uh, stringent requirements. Yeah. And so the, the purple tags indicate 100% FSC certified wood. That's Forest Stewardship yeah. Council. So uh, certain models um, that we use 100% FSC, most models have a content, you know, anywhere from 80% and up of uh, sustainably yeah. um, sourced woods with all the uh, accompanying certifications. Uh, but these purple, these purple ones, you might see, for example, on your Sean Mendez model, that's 100% FSC. Um, uh, the Earth guitars, the Biosphere guitar, uh, which have the, the really cool, funky artwork on there from Robert Getzel. So those uh, those purple tags are above and beyond uh, in terms of how we um, pick and choose. But, where presumably, we get it from. though, apart from you know, I don't know, sort of reclaimed stuff or, or really weird exotic stuff purchased presumably in minuscule quantities, the vast, vast majority of timber that you're allowed to use has got to be FSC uh, compliant, I assume. Most of it is compliant, yeah. yes. And the thing is, um, we don't like to, like, when we communicate with the world about sustainability yeah. content, uh, we are really, really committed to making sure our messaging is really clear is really accurate and the consumers know exactly what they're getting. Mm. Um, but to that end, we're sometimes overly, um, in my view, a little bit overly cautious about when we say what's sustainable and what's, you know, mm -hmm. what's not advertised explicitly that way, because the content might be 85%. And if it's not 100%, then we're not going to say this is a model that, you right. know, that is sustainable. So generally speaking, if you're buying a Martin guitar, all the woods that we purchase are mm. done responsibly, ethically, something we take very seriously. Uh, but if you're buying one that says explicitly on the label it's 100% certified content, yeah. if that's something that's important to you, rest assured it's something that's even more important to us. So that's we want to cool. make sure people are still able to build these guitars in another 200 years, you know? 100%, yeah. Uh, so here you can see some large uh, billets of yes. wood. You mentioned neck billets earlier. Yeah. Um, these are going to be resawn on some heavy duty material uh, uh, um, saws over there. Uh, this is heavy duty material. It's actually quite um, quite dense, um, able to lift that oh up. Oh my God. Yeah, it's no joke. So, um, so these saw operators who are down here cutting out necks from this material, you know, they're slinging these things around like they're nothing. Actually, this is really nice. You can see the figure yeah, uh, in this log. It's yeah. actually got a pretty good amount of, uh, pretty good amount of flame in there. <sighs> Right? It smells so good. That, that cedar ribbon lining that we use is sort of what makes the guitars smell like a you, you cigar should, box, you I, know? I honestly think Martin should go into making aftershave. You know, <laughs> essence, smell, essence smell the wood. Of wood. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow, there's tons of more. We got even more. And well, yeah, these parallelograms and these uh, funky trapezoid shapes, we cut them all out ourselves yep. um, from these much, much larger billets of wood. Um, hey, look, you, look at these. You yes. Live edge, baby. Now, back in the day, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, uh, Nakashima, the, the furniture um, designer. He does all this really organic. He sort of um, started the whole live edge um, 
natural uh, right. vibe thing with furniture. We used to resaw a lot of his wood here okay. uh, as well back in the day. So when I see stuff like this, I think, man, you know, Nakashima bench or Martin guitar all day long, give me the D18. Because, um, <laughs> like, you know, because I, I can enjoy oh, that yeah, everywhere. It's amazing. It's so cool. Mitch said this before we came in and we didn't catch it on camera, but it's surprisingly dust free, isn't it? I mean, in the last couple of factories that we've been in, you really felt as you got to the end of the day, there was a little bit of like, you know, a little bit of a tickly cough kind of thing. But, um, well, yeah, we'll yeah, see feels... we, we don't just want to protect our employees' um, singing voices, you know, <laughs> but their, their uh, safety, their personal safety, uh, is, is pretty critical. And so you can see all this it's duct massive work extraction above us. It's stuff, huge. It? And there's a, a pelletizing machine uh, out there. There's another one on the other side of the building that's actually turning a lot of wood dust, compresses it into pellets. Oh, wow. Uh, which could be burned, you know, yeah. for a heating, home heating fuel, basically. Um, oh, so there's, there's almost no waste then at all. We try to minimize as much as possible. Now, uh, that being said, um, there are pieces of wood that are fall off, right? Yeah. That are, uh, right now, we don't have a, a use for them. And so they may end up, um, you know, discarded. Yeah. A lot of the time, uh, employees who are woodworkers will actually go and see if they can take some home. Oh, you, you, okay. know, you, yeah. you gotta get permission, yeah. but, um, but that's something that we're definitely open to and encourage people's creativity even outside the factory as well. If you guys would like to watch. Yeah, uh, so what's this guy cutting the neck billets, presumably so, now? Yeah, so he has traced out um, a variety of uh, necks. Well, it looks like they're all the same neck, but they're nested into one another, such that uh, we get the biggest yield out of that piece of wood. And um, the cool thing is that the orientation of this grain is uh, is such that uh, we're cutting it on the flat saw side, so that when you turn the neck 90 yeah. degrees, that it's going to be quarter sawn uh, in the direction that'll resist the string tension. I mean, so, I. I I think it's interesting, I think, it, it, as you go through the factories, how many of these uh, processes, before you start getting into the real detailed cuts, are still just done by hand, you know, with by eye or with a pencil drawing or something. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's just cool. I mean, it's, I mean, look how quick he is as it's, well. It's I, I, would, I would be, I would, I would be so bad at this. I would have lost three fingers already, in I fairness. Mean, <laughs> these, these guys are some of the best in the world, these men and women, you know. Um, what you'll notice as well is that uh, the saw blade has been set exactly at the depth yeah. um, of this material, and that's a safety measure yeah. to make sure that there's no excess saw uh, surface exposed. We, you know, the, the amount of clearance is perfect, and I would imagine um, it has to be reset uh, depending on the exact dimensions yeah. of whatever piece you're cutting in there, whether it's for neck billets or for yeah. something else. So how many neck, he's gonna get what, three necks? He's gonna get four. four, looks like four. Okay. And then we'll have one uh, sort of fun shape in there. And on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, as part of my job in instrument design and yeah. product development, we are always trying to come up with uh, new and creative ways to use the fall-off material yeah. to make something else. Um, so you, by fall off material, you mean the stuff in the green dumper, yeah? Correct. Yeah. So let's say, you know, hypothetically, if uh, if we um, have the ability to make uh, front blocks, um, yeah. you know, and obviously on a you know on an authentic guitar, most standard series stuff, it's going to remain as a one piece yeah. solid front block. Well, it might take a little bit more labor and cost a little bit more time to take two pieces of perfectly good wood that are yeah. just too small, combine them, yeah. uh, well, that's something that we're exploring, you know? Uh, waste is our biggest enemy. Yeah. This looks interesting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> where the naughty employees are put. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, some of them like it though in there. <laughs> uh, no, this is our kiln. Uh, we, have, we have a few of them here. We're surrounded, uh, surrounded by kilns. And this is where we acclimate wood. So over the course of a few days or even uh, a few weeks, uh, wood that comes in that is not already um, dried at a level that we are confident that it's stable mm -hmm. um, dimensionally, that it's not going to warp or move, we have to make sure ourselves that things are um, dried at that level. And honestly, uh, this process uh, is also pretty important 
in that it can um, get rid of any like parasitic uh, things that may be living in the wood. Mm -hmm. The last thing we would ever want would be like some biological entity uh, <laughs> coming in. You know, you ever see that movie, The Thing? Yeah. You know, with the weird crab creature that eats people. So we want to make sure that if there's something like that that's hiding in a piece of wood, um, that the kiln drying process is going to make sure that uh, the wood's safe. You realize that I have seen the thing, yeah, and you could be that parasite if I, it was the actual thing. We could be getting the tour from the parasite <laughs> in the thing. We'd never know until at the end of it he eats me, and then and then we'd find out. Uh, it's almost so. Halloween here, so you know, uh, you've given me some ideas. Are we going our secondary acclimating yeah, room? Oh, okay. Ooh. Oh yeah. So this is uh, this has got like a almost a bit of a sauna feel. I bet the lens mists up in here. So. Um, Nice smell though. What are the what are the really big lumps? Are these just things that might get sawn into things, or is this some sort of test? Ah, uh, that's a good question. It looks like this is a piece of very nice rosewood. Yeah. Uh, that has come in in an irregular shape. Yeah. Uh, probably because it was cut hundred years ago yeah. uh, for some purpose that was not guitars. This is, I think when you were talking about what's sustainable and not sustainable, I suppose inevitably, that's a good example of just like, this has just been, you know, pr could have been cut down 50 years ago. It can't be classed as sustainable because nobody really knows where it came from, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's irresponsibly sourced. Well, we know, you know it's we, like, we'll know where it came from. Right. Um, but. Uh, but the, the question is, you know, what was it being used for before? Yeah. Um, who knows? And that's something that um, you see in the rest of the marketplace. Uh, you can you can really tell what's old growth mm. wood. Uh, a lot of the time that's been stored, that was cut for guitars, that's been properly stored. And then uh, a lot of the folks that are out there, other brands that are making lots of, you know, Brazilian rosewood guitars, mm. you can see that the trend there is more and more towards stump woods. Right. Um, so they're actually trying to find logs that were already cut uh, you know, what's left of the tree now, mm. and they're going back for seconds, basically. Right. So we, we don't like that stuff. We right. Just a quick example, you see some of these sides here, even some of the smaller ones are probably what, I mean, ukulele sides? The, uh, some of them look, yeah, these look like koa, triple O sides. But just um, remember, we gotta bend this, so getting that humidity in those small pieces is super critical, so there's a lot of control here to get that to the right spec. So, a little bit quieter in here. Um, we're kind of just in, in the next sort of area along from, from, from where all the wood was being delivered and dried. So we started with big pieces, yeah. and now we've got smaller, smaller pieces. And this will be the, the theme, more or less, of the tour, is taking bigger mm. pieces of wood and turning them into progressively I, smaller I, I, and smaller, got, more precise. I've got to be honest with you, I don't think... Uh, again, unless we didn't see certain areas when we were at Gibson or Paul Reed Smith, I, mean, you, I think you've got like minimum 10 times more lumber than those guys have got, minimum. Well, this is it's just our just... on-hand, um, this is just our on-hand lumber. We have a variety of other storage facilities where we're keeping even more um, lumber, but wow. this is the stuff that and we- And is that, is that just, sorry to interrupt right. there. I mean, this can't be indicative of like, you know, what like a month's production is. You must be, is there a sense of like, if there's good wood out there, you just want to acquire it and then um, keep, but it's just you vast. You know, uh, we're and, not like hoarders per se, um, but we do try to, you know, try to purchase enough wood to have a strategic inventory just in case there is some disruption in the supply chain. And that's something that, yeah. um, that we've seen like right now, for example, uh, at the time of the filming of this video, mm -hmm. Uh, there's some political unrest in sure. Guatemala, yeah. and shipments may be delayed, right? Of um, certain rose or certain woods that we get from from Guatemala, where it's mahogany or, or rosewood. I'm not 100 percent sure, um, it's, it's, but it's mad. I just it's it's, it's like good. in those cases, it's good to have yeah. stuff on hand, right? So that it's, it's we like can the Indiana things. Jones movie, you know, exactly. where he just like finds all the stuff that they store, and you just go. It's just vast. Yes, although in that movie, that stuff is put away and never to be seen again. <laughs> and in our world, we keep this stuff so that we can put it out into the hands yeah, of someone yeah. who's gonna enjoy it. Hopefully, many people will enjoy it over the course of the life of a guitar. This uh, this whole area here, it looks like, on the right-hand side is ribbon stock. So this is what we use for the linings of the inside of the guitar. Um, that's gonna be very, very good smelling. So you'll see we have these pieces here, and then uh, what they'll get processed into are these, um, these curved 
uh, ribbon linings, which you take a stiff piece of wood, you cut a bunch of kerf cuts in it, and now it's a flexible piece of wood. I'm gonna try to put this. You're back never gonna do that, are you? Came from. Go on, I'll. Oh boy. You're gonna have to just lean it on top. Oh boy. Oh no, I'm now get you're in trouble. trouble. Not again. Oh, no, you did it. Well done. Ah, here. Oh. Okay, there we okay, go. We'll just well, pretend. Everything Shh. in its right we place. We weren't here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell Morgan back there. So It's, um, it's on tight. So You're here you can see, I mean, just the diversity of woods that we use. We've got uh, certified cherry here, certified machiche, um, all, all these purple tags, 100% uh, FSC certified uh, cedar for our ribbon linings. Um, and uh, the Holy Grail, of course, if this was Indiana Jones, would be right around the corner. Yeah. So would you guys like to see our most precious treasures? Oh, would we? <laughs> Lead on. So we have come down to a special section of the um, timber storage here, lumber. You call it lumber, don't acclimating, you? Acclimating, our acclimating um, zone. And there's some, all sorts of examples of interesting stuff here, but Joe, is gonna tell us uh, about some of the sort of pieces of wood on here. And I guess this is about selecting the special edition kind of stuff, is it? Yes, it is. This is this is different species that we have that we offer to dealers when they come in. So when you're looking down here, this is a book match set of Pomelay Sapili. And when you get the right angle and the figure in that, that's what people are looking for. What's your, what's your background then is your, what's your is your role here to, to sort of manage the more unusual the rarer kind of timbers that come yes through? i deal with the custom shop all dealers that come in they come down here to select wood mm -hmm. i take care of all the inventory and I'm, I'm a wood guy right not so much guitars but wood <laughs> I, I like wood you have exceptional figured koa yeah get some really nice flame in that koa is a special wood that's the um the one that you cannot now cut down in Hawaii, right? And, and you have to just wait for Mother Nature to knock right. a tree over and then see what you got. Right, right. So I guess that's pretty difficult to, you know, get hold of. Yes, it is. Um, This looks beautiful, what's this? Yes, so this is wild grain East Indian rosewood. This is an example too with the patterns. You could go one direction, which is our traditional mm -hmm. grain goes towards the neck. Or if you just want to capture all the figure, you can go different direction, capture more. That's beautiful. Bit of quilted. Yep, quilted maple. Quilted maple, yep. And then I guess it's and just then a this beautiful. Is, this is another piece of, of East Indian rosewood. Yeah. Fancy East Indian rosewood. I mean that. That I kind of think you know if you flip a Martin guitar over, you know, that's almost what you want to see, isn't it? Just that sort of hyper traditional. Well, I suppose it's up to you, isn't it? See whatever you like. But right. that's kind of for me. I guess I think I stay with with that. Just you know, keep it you know authentic. Um, yeah. And then you have got. These little, almost like little violin backs, but I guess they're ukulele backs, right? Correct. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like once it's polished and varnished. Exactly. Is this kind of wood that you're able to um, specify from sources that I'm looking for something interesting? Or is it almost like just big blocks of wood come in and as you're unloading it, somebody here yourself maybe has to go, whoa, hang on, that piece there, I need this for the, you know, how does that work? No, this, this material is something that we source from the vendor that, as this. We ask for wild right. grain, they send us wild grain. Right. Or we ask for flame koa, they send us flame koa. Now, with that being said, we do process lumber, or like for mahogany, mm -hmm. and there are times where you'll come across a piece of mahogany that's just insane. Yeah. So yes, then we will use that, you know, for exotics also, but. That's cool. And I gather as well, Carmen has sort of managed to find an example maybe of something that is a little bit out of the ordinary. Yeah, so. I mean, this isn't exactly something out of the ordinary, but I think this might be something you're interested in, Lee. I just want to take a look real quick. Yeah. Do you see what this is? Um, be Mr. Mayor's. Uh. <laughs> so you kind of see how we go through and... Uh, oh, well, that's cool. So is this going to be for one of the new black and silver, yep. like the silver burst ones? Yep. I hadn't actually appreciated on those that it was an inlaid yep. pick guard. I've only yep. seen the sort of the, the, the press shots of the guitar. Wow. Did you know that? Did you see that, Pete? That it's got yeah, the. You, I did see that. Yeah, I see you're paying more attention than me, aren't you? And that's uh, Engelman Spruce. These are Correct. real tops that will end up on yeah, guitars. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. They may end up in Andertons. They may. Those are just set aside. Those are actually going into production today. I got to take those upstairs. Wow, there you go. If I may uh, jump in here, mm. you notice one of our uh, waste reduction strategies. <laughs> it's actually, a, there are production <laughs> reasons for it too, but we don't have pearl 
underneath where the uh, fingerboard extension is actually going to cover it. Yeah. Um, and that there's a few reasons, you know, that joint up there between the pieces of uh, binding, some instruments have that exposed and that takes quite a bit more time and energy to get it exactly where it needs to mm. be. But knowing in this case that it's going to be covered by the tongue or the, the fingerboard means we can save a little time and a little bit of material. Wow, how how and thin also is that piece of rosewood Just remember well. too, that the bottom of that fingerboard will continue with pearl. Yeah. So one thing to think about is the complexity and the geometry that has to be worked out in yeah. here to get it yeah. to look right. So, but yeah, this must be so thin. This piece of um, yeah. is that it's a ebony? Yeah. Is it? Yep. Because I was just going on the back to go. Does it go yep. through to the back? But it's just presumably what laser etched or something in there, yep. and then. Yeah. John does it all himself. Doesn't he? He's <laughs> he's literally down here this afternoon. We might see him later. You know. He's, he's not here really. <laughs> you know, out of all the, uh, the signature guitars that we do, um, I've not worked directly with Mr. Mayer or anything like that, but he is one of the most engaged, mm -hmm. um, most uh, interested, um, most sort of specific in trying to achieve the things that he's looking for compared to many, yeah. many artists. Yeah. I mean, he's a real guitar guy. Uh, yeah much more so than, than some of the folks you might think of uh, with signature models. It's like, we, we, wow, we've deeply had invested. That, we've had that message from Paul at Paul Reed Smith as well. Same thing, whether it's guitars, amps, pickups, switches, mm -hmm. you know, watches. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the like payoff at the end is incredible, it. that the product yeah. is really yeah. uh, a good reflection of what the artist really wants yeah. and values. Yeah. Yeah. Which is really important, yeah. the most important thing. Yep. Right. He's happy, right? I think we're done right up here. Thanks, Joe, that's awesome. Um, wow. I'm excited maybe one day to actually, you know, come back and do this whole wood choosing thing. Oh, can we just get a shot of up here as well? Look at all this. The periodic table of wood. Wow. Do you know this off by heart, Joe? Could I test you? I do not you? know it by heart. <laughs> <laughs> my travel heart. <laughs> so it gives you, I see, so you've got basically, it's just showing you sort of typically how heavy the wood is relative to each other. How heavy the wood is and yeah. it's color coded for where it's harvested. It's brilliant. I, I'm, I'm not going to take credit for this. I was almost going to take credit for this. Mark's just said, you know, what he sees when he sees all these guitar necks that are sort of all these parts waiting to be made in guitars. He sees millions of songs. It's quite deep, Mark. I'm sort of, you know, it's just like that is... Do you know what, interestingly as well, that the, the guys at Martin were, were pains to say that this uh, screw uh, hole here that, you know, with the with the... I mean, I, I'm useless at technical spec, but this is just a locator. There is the, the, the necks are still a glued in uh, set neck join. That This this uh, hole is... We use that to affix a handle for yeah. spraying them. Right. So there's really not a great way to hold on to a guitar neck when you're yeah. spraying we, it. Uh, we, but yeah, we I use think that you, to you, affix you a handle yeah. for spraying Concerned, them. Concerned, obviously, right. so so much there's really not a great way to hold you know, on to a guitar neck when you're spraying it. And stuff, but you, you wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that, uh, yeah, this is not part of how the guitar would, the neck would be fit to the guitar, Correct. so anyway, Correct. little just in case. I'm now not even sure I'm putting this back in the right place, so uh, when somebody gets a Martin with the wrong neck on it, that was totally my fault, I'm sorry. So just real quick, this would be the, basically where we produce parts. Yeah. So everything comes in as Ramin explained, it's pushed over here, a lot of CNC machines, a lot of manual cutting. Um, always looking for ways to improve how we process parts in terms of we don't like waste. Um, always trying to do things a little bit more efficient. I mean, we know with inflation and costs coming up, we can't continue to pass price increases to Andertons and our customers, so we'll always look for better ways. One thing I'd like to show you real quick, if we come over here, you see these purple sanding belts? Yeah. So in the past, we used an abrasive, standard abrasive, that would clog up with oil, right? Yep. The rosewood's very oily. We were throwing these away constantly. Yeah. So what we did is switched over to a ceramic sandpaper. It's actually a self-sharpening sandpaper where it breaks off and resharpens itself. The good part is you can take this belt, we put it over in that dry ice machine, and now you can reuse it's it. It's reusable sandpaper. Some of these belts now, where we were throwing one or two, three away, sometimes every few days now can last several, several weeks. So just cool. one example, we'll head over here, Lee. Um, this is the grading bench. So what my coworkers are doing here is just checking every side what Rich is doing is marking out any little piece he sees. 
Um, they're also going to take a look. I'm going to introduce you to my coworker over here. She's going to give us an explanation uh, in more detail than I am See, about what's going on. You're, you're just making sure that these two pieces of wood are similarly matched so they can go on the same, they can be used as two sides of the same guitar. Yeah. Oh, I see you. Open knots, you know, project all that out. Then we mark the pattern, one size guitar, they'll fit. Cool. Number them, and then we match them with the back. Brilliant. Hey, Lee. I am Hope. Hope. Good to meet you. Lee, Pete, Mark, Taylor, the gang. Nice to meet you guys. Uh, what we typically do after we get the material um, is we number and inspect, like Rich is doing over here and Dave. Um, now, when we get our material, it comes from all different lots and trees and such and such, so we have to match it up as best we can to make it look like it's um, all from one oh, So there's tree. no, there's, so the, the two sides of a guitar, there's no guarantee it's from the same tree, so you're just visually trying to match grain to, to ensure that the, it, I guess it looks like it's all from exactly. the same tree. Exactly, as best you can. Yeah. And, um, you know, you can say sometimes it came from the same general patch of land, yeah, yeah. that doesn't guarantee it's going to be the exact same. So, so I guess it's not like um, when you're doing sort of tops on an electric guitar and you're splitting a billet and you're doing that sort of butterfly thing, it doesn't work like that it on would this. Be, no. It would be awesome if it worked that <laughs> way, but you know, these trees are pretty narrow, um, yeah. so you can't get all of that from one. Right. So, you know, you go through, you take your backs from, you know, let's say we've marked out 200, you look through, we would fill these holes two tables um, with sides and you just kind of see, all right, well, what looks similar? You know, it's close, but the Not color's quite. a little yeah. bit off, so yeah. I wouldn't necessarily match that. Um, you know, and you just keep going through them until you find what you would call like a perfect match. So this one's pretty nice. Um, you know, they kind of go together, the size of the little even, bit even on the backs, I thought the backs were book matched stories. And they are, I'm so sorry. Yeah, so the back, it's just, just the sides, right? Right, yeah, okay. so it's book matched like this as so well. The, so the backs are from the same piece of wood that's book matched, so it is just the sides that you're trying to... Exactly, yeah. and so this would be an example of maybe like a grade three, it's a grade one to four scale. Mm -hmm. um, so this would be a considerably nicer guitar just because the match looks pretty good. You know, it looks almost as though it came from the same tree. So, quite generally, that's what we do over here. And I mean, it, we could be walking in circles for hours, or we can hammer out a whole bunch in 30 that's minutes. Cool. You know. I mean, obviously, you haven't been here as maybe as long as some of these guys by the looks it of dogs. things. It's that obvious. <laughs> but I mean, how long have you been doing this for? Um, here, I've been here for three years. Right. And then I've been woodworking, you know, since I was... That's your life, is it? Just, oh, I that's think cool. so. Uh, I think it's amazing. You want to take some souvenirs, Tom? I can't we... offer that, but <laughs> I'd like to offer. I'm sure we will find an off-cut of something somewhere as a memento of our, uh, well, of our, of our day here. Well, will hook you up. He's a nice guy. Awesome. He's, got, he's got the goods. Well, cheers, Hope. Thank you very much for, Thank for, you so for, much, for Lee. taking it's the time. Great to All right. you. Take care. This is an interesting area, Lee. I think we're going to start right here. These are clamp carriers. So what you're seeing is this operator is actually gluing the two backs together. This, this piece over here, this clamp carrier is about maybe 15, 20 years old. But this one here was probably in use since the 40s, made out of old railroad equipment. It's, you know, obviously built like a tank. It's got all the steel to it, and it still works as good as it did back then today. One of the things that is quite fascinating as well is another big difference between electric guitar and, and acoustic guitar. Your surface area to glue together is, you know, like two, two or three millimeters. It's not yes. like, a, you know, it's not like, right. you know, five, 50 mil or something like that. And even on these, you're inlaying, you know, the, it's not even like you're gluing two bits of wood together, Correct. you're laying a, a, an insert in there. But is that a, I mean, I, got, I, I picked up a, a piece over there and it, once it's glued, it feels like a single piece of wood. Yeah, I mean, the, just basic wood shop is, in my opinion, if the glue joint is correct and you go to break the wood, it theoretically should not break on the glue joint yeah. if it's done correctly. Yeah. Glue application is extremely important to your point, Lee. You see what he's doing right there? Yeah. He's using a glue wheel. Right. Okay, so there's an example of a tool we use to ensure the right amount of glue goes on that top. Yeah. Any glue joint, 
should have squeeze out, yeah. right? You should see the glue coming out. You don't want too much glue yeah. going out, yeah. but it should never be dry. So the right amount of glue in the applications, very important. How, how long does it uh, how long does it take for the glue to set? I don't I don't know off the top of my head what the drying times are, but I believe in some applications it's probably shorter today than you might think. I, I think when I saw that they, they had a very similar machine to this, I think in Gibson. And they were basically saying by the time it had done one full rotation. Yeah, it's about 20 minutes. It was completely 20, 30 minutes dry, dry. is good enough today in some of the, yeah. the more the synthetic adhesives. Yeah. It's pretty cool though, isn't it? I just realized as well, you said made out of railway tracks. You can see the, there they are. They're the yeah. railway tracks. That's mad. Brilliant. I love it. Another, you think about all the, thousands of Martin guitars that have been made over the years, how many amazing songs have been written on them. There they are. That's probably where the backs were, you know, glued together. Definitely. Okay, so a little bit of a break from the, uh, the factory tour for no reason other than the fact that this is just kind of, this custom shop office is just sort of on the way. So Carmen, Danny, um, Tell us what goes on, and this is like a magical little office, this one. So what's going on in here? So, you know, obviously in the Martin Custom Shop, it's a key component to our business. We do a lot of it through Andertons. Um, we can pretty much make almost anything within reason in terms of the acoustic guitar. Uh, that is always not easy to do. So a lot of different ideas have to come to us and somebody has to figure out how to get this through the floor. Make sure that we're able to build it, make sure that all of the dimensions and specifications can go together. There's a lot to it. There's a lot of different bracing patterns, angles and designs that may not go with maybe a 12 fret guitar or something you're looking to do. So typically how it happens is if you go to Andertons, you wanna order a Martin Custom Shop guitar, they get a hold of our distributor at Westside and they work directly with Danny and myself. So what Danny does is Danny's a pretty unique coworker. I've worked <laughs> and known Danny. He's uh, actually grown up right next to the Martin North Street factory. So Danny makes his own guitars and is very uh, familiar with how Martin makes guitars. So he's the one that gets the spec sheet, works with me to say, hey, I'm gonna get it into work. Here's what it's gonna look like. If there's any things that need to change, we'll work with Andertons and the, our distributor west side and um end up creating you know this is just one example of some yeah, what, of the amazing things Danny. what have you got in here that you've had, uh, been involved in then um i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna say this one For right sure. out of the box okay um beautiful this is an italian alpine top zero cody back and sides what, what, what did someone actually ask for? Just like a, a D45 style or what, 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 how, did it, how does the conversation start? Here? This conversation will start as I love a 42 right. dreadnought instrument, but I'm thinking about doing a different back and side set of wood. What kind of top can you help me pair with that back yeah. and side set of wood to bring the best out of that guitar as a whole? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm like uh, the... Eh, let me think about that. We can work with this. You know, again, the alley, it's, this one is Italian Alpine. It's gorgeous. Gorgeous I mean, I, I don't think we do. I don't think we do enough or any. I don't think of this. My guys are talking to customers about making the Fender of their dreams or the Gibson of their dreams all the time. Right. Um, maybe it's just like a, a, a well kept secret. This kind of thing. So, I guess you know you're working within historical shapes. Correct. So you've got to have Correct. You know the, the, a base model that you can't That's deviate right. from. Yeah. But presumably you can go for headstock styles, inlays, yes. different types of timbers, Correct. Nice. bracing patterns. Yeah, bracing patterns. I mean, um, this is the reveal maple flame maple binding on here just looks yeah. stunning. It's it, it is it's sharp. There's numerous different head plate inlays. There's a torch. There's an alternate torch. We have a script logo. We have a fancy tree of life that you've seen on a previous oh, yes. instrument. We can't um, show you that one. I was going to say, but that one's very <laughs> special. But you know, it's just trying to make sure that what you're doing as a complete thought yeah. works together well. You it's don't want, fabulous. you know, you don't want a blue with a green and a, you know, you know. I, I'm being ridiculous, yeah. but no, um, that's beautiful. the truth of it. You you want yeah. to try and keep everything that's as coordinated I, as possible. I, I think we ought to try and 
encourage you know customers to just because we've got some amazing sales guys who've been yep. selling yep. Martin guitars you know for all their lives and I think it would be I, I like the idea again they'll get like a rough idea come back talk to you yes. um, I mean this is this is where you're sort of going you've probably had your D18 and your D28 right. and you're sort of going you've got some right. special birthday coming up or you've had some milestone in your life and you're just going right yeah. I'm doing it now yeah so that's there's, a beautiful guitar, there's, you isn't know, it? Different things we can do. There's different body sizes, different shapes, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, a little bit, mm. um, we do have to watch where we go, but for the most part, we try and get you what you want. So there's a, uh, it's like, a, I'm like a kid in a candy shop in here. There's a couple of things that I want to show you. One, one was, we might as well start with this. I spotted this um, top and, the, uh, and there's a back over there as well that um, was being kind of, made as we sort of walked in, or at least some of the bracing was being uh, glued and, and checked. And I was like, so what is, I've never seen this. It's like, I mean, I, I initially just assumed it was just some ornate carving for the sake of ornate carving. Ah. I gather that is not the case. Well, sometimes we do uh, beautiful things for no reason other than that they're, you know, Can we beautiful. Grab that one as well? This um, was the, this but, was the back. Uh, in this case, um, so this is uh, semi, uh, semi secret. This is proprietary stuff that we've been developing. We always are working on uh, new and exciting ways to optimize um, the tone of a guitar um, and to make use of woods, in this case, uh, maple and walnut, for example, um, that are perhaps less uh, ac accepted uh, in the market of Martin guitars. Mm -hmm. In Martin world, you know, we have a rosewood and mahogany kind of uh, gang, right? Yeah. And, um, and we really believe in other woods as well, uh, whether it's maple or walnut or any other woods that are sort of domestic, locally available, not pressured in any kind of way. And so um, this is just one of the ways that we are working to optimize the tone uh, of guitars made with uh, non-traditional tone woods and sustainable tone woods. And so uh, I can't give you all the deets, uh, all the tea on exactly when or what is coming to market, uh, wink, wink. Um, but uh, someday you may find some of these features, which our R&D team uh, under Nate Hoffman and, and our, our guys, uh, Josh and Brent over there have worked really, really hard um, to uh, not just make an acceptable uh, mm. guitar out of uh, maple and walnut, but to make an exceptional guitar out of uh, maple and walnut. That first and foremost, when you play it, and I, I, Danish Pete may be uh, strumming one back there now, we can't show it obviously, but, um, so coming some coming soon to uh, to a music store near you, perhaps. Uh, in I mean, I'm always fascinated <laughs> by the sort of you know it's a, it's a 200 year old concept, the acoustic guitar, and still trying to find ways of you know sort of. Um, Adjusting, in fact, it's more, way more than 200 years if you go back. I'm talking about the Martin Dreadnought yeah, style thing. Yeah, well, yeah, sonic, um, sonic channeling, uh, mm. weight relief, um, optimized bracing patterns. These are things that we never, mm. um, you know, we never imagined, you know, probably 20 years ago, this is where we would go. Or, but uh, we have to always keep developing, right? I, I feel bad now. This is like, obviously, I haven't done this for many, many years, but you know when you're a bar talking to somebody, but there's like somebody over the, the uh, you just yes. made eye contact with yes. them like that. This is kind of what's happening to me at the moment. But instead Tell of, me about her, there's not, a, there's not a beautiful lady, <laughs> and there is a beautiful lady over here. Can we see this? Absolutely. So oh, uh, man. a couple years ago, um, we wanted to uh, do something special, um, you know, um, unsolicited, uh, just, uh, just as a, uh, a, a gift, um, a, a token of our appreciation for, uh, a certain touring musician uh, that we love and collaborate with regularly. And so um, at the time we were still experimenting uh, with the SC platform and what we could do. So in this room are all kinds of prototypes and things that will probably never see the light of day. Um, this may be one of them, but um, I built uh, a pair of Coca-Bolo uh, SCs. Um, one of them we gave to Mr. Mayer and the other one um, we kept here, and uh, so it's here, it gets played in the custom shop, it's got beautiful uh, Tree of Life uh, pearl ivoroid binding, um, and it's not finished, actually, uh, there's a few little finishing touches that we want to put on there, but, you know, they, theoretically, if we were to ever sell it, but, uh, but for now, it just, it lives here along with a few other um, prototypes. The, in, the inlay on the custom shop stuff is... Insane. I'm so used to kind of seeing inlay where you see a little bit of the filler around the edge. It's like, this is immaculate. 
Well, it's like it's off the charts. When we get over to um, the custom shop and you guys get to see Chris uh, doing his work, uh, you guys will will really get a first hand up close view of just how precise and mm. uh, and detail oriented we can be here. Well, um, fabulous. Thank you very right. much. Thank yeah. you, Danny. It was really great welcome. to meet you, and nice I sincerely you, hope sir. that. At some point, we'll be hooking up some customers with you and they'll be making their dream guitars as well. So anyway, Excellent. onwards with the tour. Rock on. Well, now that you have seen exactly how we sort woods and take really large pieces and yep. turn them into more manageable pieces of uh, material, yep. uh, up here on the shop floor is where we really start the detail level, uh, the assembly, and uh, further workmanship that needs to take place with the woods. So, uh, in this area, uh, you'll see that the tops that were glued up downstairs are being cut out on our laser table. Um, the laser is a great tool for us. It's high tech, uh, but it's also very, very precise and requires a lot of human input in order to locate and orient the pieces exactly in the right when, spot. When, when about in kind of Martin's history would it have moved away from an actual blade cutting these out to a laser? Uh, probably about 15 years ago. And presumably just massively cleaner lines, requires less finishing. Extremely precise, Yeah. Um, extremely accurate, uh, and it allows us to incorporate a lot of the rest of the locating fixtures, you know, yeah. like our Mickey Mouse ears the locating devices that we use to put things on fixturing. Cool. Um, so, laser, super, super cool. Uh, now, I know, Lee, if you had x-ray vision, uh, <laughs> you would do all sorts of things, um, but <laughs> once you've finished... Maybe. <laughs> once you've finished uh, examining the outside of the wood, yep. uh, you have to take a look inside and see what's going on. And so, to that end, this is one of my favorite displays. Um, if I illuminate the wood from the back, we can see uh, that there's uh, some uh, unsightly things in here. We have a sap, a sap pocket, uh, for example. This one, you can't hardly see it when the light's off. And so, uh, in an effort to make sure that no undesirable things end yeah, up on the guitar. You do this for every single top. Every single top. Every single one. Um, and That's we, insane. Yes, we used to call this the candling process because you'd do it with a you know candle back in you know 1830s. So they, they even used to do this before. Oh, absolutely. With a, absolutely. But you know it's crazy. It doesn't look like anything until you turn the lights on. You say, ah, oh, okay. So, uh, so we this don't would be rejected, would it? Now it could, except that now we can locate our oh, guitar top here. You see, and that's magically clever. that gets cut out. That gets covered by the bridge. What do you say in England? Bob's your uncle, and the exactly. rest of it is good, wrong. is good to go. So, um, oh hey man, how's it going? Now uh, uh, you can't see them right now, but these trucks here are pretty cool. They actually have a little robotic uh, courier who comes to pick them up and moves them around. We have another tour coming through, oh, so we're gonna okay. take a walk this away. Uh, so every one of these tops is being examined. Um, in this area here, um, we first cut and then install the rosettes. And so those beautiful classic Martin rosettes, they start off uh, as little teeny I individual pieces. In this case, the black fiber. You feel free it's to- It's just tiny, it's yeah. so thin. It's so cute and, uh, and uh, maple here. So all those cool, uh, like those 15 series rosettes that are real, uh, real low key, uh, you're using natural materials like this. And then uh, of course the, the 28s and such will be using uh, bolter on. In this case, our life is a little easier because we've got a black and white piece combined into one. Um, antique white, uh, which is a very good substitute for Ivoroid. It's more dimensionally yeah. stable. It's not prone to some of the problems you see with uh, celluloid uh, materials. Here's a, a high-tech laser cutting out a high-tech guitar. Now, uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to tell you guys this, but I'm gonna tell you anyway, <laughs> that this shape looks an awful lot like an SC model, and this material looks an awful lot like mahogany. So, oh. by the process of deduction, maybe wow. you can uh, you can tell me what may or may not be <laughs> in the pipeline. Um, but that's very exciting stuff, and we're thrilled about it. So, uh, it looks like we're cutting out some sides here, and the sides are actually cut uh, uh, two at a time. So you have both 
uh, the treble and the bass side. They're stacked up directly on top of each other, and that's so that the cut is going to go through both, and they'll be perfectly book matched uh, when the time comes to actually unfold them. You'll have a perfectly symmetrical side set. Is he just using magnets there or something to yep. hold it in place? Exactly. Here it comes. That's a laser. Shield your eyes, boys. No, you're, you're all right. <laughs> Uh, now, one of the great uh, advantages of the laser is that it lets you smell uh, each and every wood um, in, a, in a new and unique way. You know, we don't like to burn wood around here, but, you know, obviously there's some small amount that's getting burned. Uh, and you can really see why they call it rosewood, because it smells just like roses. That's fantastic. We'll see if it's, I can get a, get a piece for It's pretty fast as well, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's very efficient. So another, another benefit to this is Anybody that does wood, woodworking, you know that when you start to cut cross grain, you mm -hmm. start to get tear outs. That right. was a huge source of waste for us. Yeah. So with the laser, the router, we're not using a router anymore. Feel how smooth that is, Lee. Yeah, I think I, think I said that. I, I noticed that before. It's like there's a lot less hand sanding is going to need to go on on these edges. It's so, so smooth. 40% reduction yeah. in scrap rate yeah. at this operation by moving over to a laser. That's great. Here, I'm going to grab you guys a piece of rosewood here so you can sniff it. <laughs> so, it's, oh, it's, it's good. It's good. It smells like rose. Smell it. Smell it. Like, yeah, have a whip. It's kind of like... It is like open fire, isn't it? When you walk into somewhere and oh, it smells good. Good stuff. Uh, oh, we're interrupting a That's all right. We'll, we'll start right here okay. and then we'll make our way forward. Um, I don't know if you can only see through here, but uh, our buddy Rick here is working on, a, uh, on an authentic model. So um, these instruments, are built uh, more or less exactly the way that they would have been built in the 1930s. It looks like a, a 1937 authentic D18. Um, are we going to see um, where the the sides are molded yes, on absolutely. this on this tour? Because I always think that's kind of cool. It's one of my favorite operations as well. Uh, and so we actually have our satin uh, uh, ribbon um, that's in there. It's a sort of side reinforcement. If you look in a lot of those vintage guitars, that's what they'll have in there. And then Rick is going to use hot hide glue uh, to assemble the, the ribbon lining on the inside of the side. And uh, hot hide glue, uh, pretty difficult stuff to work with. It has a very short open time. Um, you can uh, end up with problems if your joinery isn't quite perfect or your clamping methods aren't quite perfect. And you have to keep the glue wet. So uh, really challenging, really old school. And that lamp is going to actually heat up uh, the surfaces as well a little bit. Uh, it's not just for illumination. That'll help things dry and cure a little faster. So this is an animal protein glue. Uh, back in the day, they would have used uh, horses, so, you know, send them to the knacker's yard. Yeah. And nowadays... They, Melt the hooves and all that kind yeah, of stuff. Uh, yeah. Nowadays, we uh, the gelatin, I believe, is mostly from rabbits, but this is a very traditional, very old school uh, type of adhesive. Um, you know, goes back to, to prehistoric times as far as its utility in making stuff and sticking things together. And uh, I love, I love how, yeah, ye old fashioned clothes pegs. Yeah. <laughs> Not just for uh, parties <laughs> anymore. Not just for nipples. <laughs> And this one a little bit further on in terms of its... Absolutely. Uh, and here you can see uh, Chris, a.k.a. Spaceman. Is, Spaceman? Uh, Spaceman. He is the man uh, from outer space. And same, he, same kind of glue? Yes, this is all hot hide glue. Uh, this is an authentic 28, it looks like. And you can see that um, he's actually pocketed the ribbon already, cut small uh, yeah. pockets out so that the braces will tuck perfectly into the ribbon lining when he slaps the top on this instrument and then uh, puts it in the glue up press to apply pressure um, top and back. Is the back already glued on there? Yes. So this differs in, from our standard production. Um, uh, as we mentioned, the back is already glued on. In, uh, in standard production, we glue the top and back on at the same time using a, a PVA, like an acetate type glue. But here, um, the back goes on first, everything gets cleaned up, 
uh, on some of our authentic models, the aged ones, we actually uh, use a, a proprietary blend of herbs and spices on the inside of the instrument to make them smell like old guitars. <laughs> um, not kidding, not kidding. Uh, it's it's crazy. Uh, well, why it why is this like one in a chips. why is this one in a in a clamp? Whereas the previous guy is that because it's got ah, the the so, back on already? So that's or? getting ribboned right, right now. But when you actually go to glue the top and the back on, yeah. um, if you don't have good support all the way around the outer perimeter of the rim, it that moves, size, does it? It yeah, can blow okay. right out. Right. It still wants to be a tree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the pressure that comes down to affix the top there of it that comes. is there so it great comes. that it could it could explode the whole. Yeah, this is a great thing. example of the locator pins now yeah. as well. Why you need those? And then the other locator pins are on the top hall. Yeah. Hall. yeah. Amazing. We've got a room at the end here. It looks like we got two guitars. Ah, so the authentic model, um, rather than going in this heated uh, ladder press here, the authentic models go in a hand crank, yep. uh, a hand crank press, and then as soon as that's down, Chris is going to check for a squeeze out uh, around the whole instrument. Pull on another one here, ready to take a look at it. What do we got? Ah, double O, or triple O. Yeah. So this one, again, the back is glued on and uh, cleaning up any little extra bits of high glue. It's funny, if you look at um, some vintage guitars uh, from other makers who will remain nameless, uh, you look inside there and it's like, man, the high glue is everywhere, just gobs of it. And yep. uh, one thing that sort of sets us apart is that we've always uh, maintained a certain uh, clean German uh, sensibility <laughs> around uh, how things should look even on the inside where no one uh, no one is going to see them. It's amazing. We sweat the small stuff, you know? Yeah. Uh, so when it comes to bracing in our standard production line, uh, we have hey. so many different models, uh, different materials, <laughs> uh, body shapes that each one of them has its own optimized um, bracing pattern. And you can sort of see the difference um, you know this double O sloped shoulder it's got uh, a very it's more delicate guitar it's got a cross brace it's got two tone bars and then you look at this grand jumbo wow it's getting three tone bars three side braces on each side and that's just um, a function of how much more uh, tension is on certain instruments. These, these are like waffle makers. Yes. But it, is so, the, so this is essentially once they're glued on, this is the press, is it, that sort of clamps yeah, it in place? So essentially what we do is we take the top, we put it here, it's uh, upside down. Mm -hmm. um, these are heated, so you can feel that. It's not going to burn you or anything, but uh, that's to accelerate the glue drying time. And then we'll apply the braces, um, you know, with a, with a glue wheel, we'll get some glue on the braces, put them down there. And then when we close this, the, uh, the bladder will suck down uh, evenly around all the braces, like, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's latex, so it's very mm -hmm. uh, form-fitting, and when it goes down there, you can really see the but bracing pattern just, just, ghosting just right Just to give through. people the idea, so the top goes on, yep. the template goes over the top, the braces the, go in. The operative is gluing these and fitting yep. these however they're supposed to, and exactly. then clamp it down. And then, uh, you know, 15 minutes later, it's ready to clean up oh, cool. uh, the glue squeeze out. It works pretty good. And there are certain areas we like to reinforce too. Uh, the bridge plate, very critical. So we'll, we'll apply a little extra pressure on that. Um, in our custom shop. Um, wow, what this looks like. Um, what even is this? This is really cool. So this pedestal here uh, is what we use to hold a neck in position. So uh, I won't clamp it in here. Um, and we'll hold it in position just like that so that it can be worked on with a draw knife or files and rasps. And then in the course of uh, carving a neck, your file may get loaded up and clogged with um, bits of, of wood shavings, right? And so you can take a brush and sort of scrape it all out or you can give it a quick tap tap right there. And, and this, uh, is, this is just years this and is years, just of, years of, of tap tap. tap. tap and uh, get wow. ready to go. In fact, uh, my colleague Mike is coming through here. Mike is one of the finest neck carvers on planet Earth. Uh, <laughs> this gentleman has no, no pressure. tens and tens of thousands of necks. And uh, he, might, he might not do one. I'm not sure if he's got anything on the schedule, but you may be able to catch a glimpse of, of uh, how he operates. What are the chances uh, that we can let Lee uh, try his hand at, at ruining some fine <laughs> guitar materials? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, find, find me a damaged, shitty one. You, thought, you never know. You thought we were just gonna show you around and not put no, you to work? A, what a, I, stuck a, <laughs> I stuck a slash sticker on a slash guitar at the Gibson factory. So, you know, <laughs> nice. Okay, excellent. Very good. Does this man look trustworthy? Sure. All right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it took him a while there, didn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Don't give me anything sharp. I'll be fine. You know, a dull chisel is more dangerous than a sharp chisel. Is it? Uh, yes. In fact, that's something, it's a misconception. A lot of people, you know, would, would probably think the opposite, but if you try to work uh, doing precision woodwork with a dull chisel, it might hang up and bind and slip and uh, you can really hurt yourself. Um, now you can hurt yourself plenty good with a sharp chisel too, as, as you can see. I've got, <laughs> I bear the scars of many incidents over the years. But, um, can if, we see, just before you put this in then, can we, so this is essentially how the... This is what they will come from up, from downstairs. Okay, so you... the CNC machine. So you can see that, that there's obviously a, a flat edge, a much flatter edge than is natural on the sides, and a much sort of rougher Because that's brought in feel. on a belt sander. Yeah. yeah. No. Um, so your, I guess your role is to, is to now, by hand, I'm kind of amazed, mm. but by hand, make that edge and, and the back of the neck feel like a nice round, smooth. Yeah, I don't really have one that's, that's kind of a finished shaped neck, but we do this so it cuts down on the time from yeah. like four hours to do yeah. one neck. Now it takes an hour. Okay. Um, I, and you, I noticed you had those, some little metal templates. Yeah. So that, so this is presumably different models and different years mm -hmm. and stuff. I've yeah. always been fascinated. And it, does the, I see. So you've got a yeah. first tenth. Yeah, I, I'll split I get it, it more yeah. when I get over there. But this is like our thickness gauge. Mm -hmm. So I can make it however thick I want, but this is going to be a low profile. And these are our radius. This will do it the first first fret and the tenth fret, mm -hmm. the radiuses. And then this is a swoop. And then the side profile of the heel also. And so, this will do our heel cap too. So, so this gauge does so everything. As it goes from that first to the tenth fret, is that just down to your your yep. skill and your yep. sense yeah, of like yeah, how do you want that to blend? Uh, get a straight edge. Yep. Um, use that. Right. So, right now. so you can make sure this, yeah, you haven't sort yeah, of overcarved. This is my favorite one. This is from 1974. So that's how old it is. But I, also, I do get it calibrated so it's flat all the time. So I, I like using that one. It's a very old one. It's older than oh, me. That, so. I mean, I, I, I'd love to see you just, you know, do a few. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll get at it. I'll put you up on here too. Yeah, yeah. excellent. So this is, this is like a demo neck, I call them. Right. See, I already have it. I already have the thickness. That's why I said I'll explain mm -hmm. all this one. Uh, you should have told him it was uh, going straight to Mr. Clapton or something like that. <laughs> it was the going pressure, on, you know? It was going on his if he ordered one. <laughs> yeah. That's at the end. We don't let them know until they're finished. Like, oh, you ordered a guitar, here's your neck. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, uh, well, before we start, I'll have to take your jewelry so that we don't damage any uh, instruments. You can have these yeah. back later. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> that is the policy, though. So here's our thickness at our first fret. Right. And then here's our tenth fret. Okay. So once I have that down, I don't need that no more. Hopefully I won't need that no more. Let me see if I got it right. All right. See, now I got a little bit of a, this is going to be a low profile one and three quarters. So that's this, the size of my fingerboard. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, I have some daylight right there. Yeah. So you I mean, I was going to say, if I was, Tiny bit. if I was woodworking, that would be acceptable. But yeah. at your level, you're no. going like, you know, I mean, it's like the most minuscule. So we've yeah. got to try and so, get that. I'm gonna need a little a bit. bit, so I'm gonna use a less aggressive file yeah, right now. Yeah. So, and then this is like when I'm training, I call it cheating, because I just mark it, so I know where I gotta oh, hit. Oh right, okay. But I just, I can just put it on there and know what I gotta take off. Let's go a little bit. See, it's getting there. Yeah. I still got a little bit right yep. there, so I'll get that. It's basically, wherever the the gauge is hitting, that's where you want to hit it with. You know, take the meat off. Yeah, it's more the edges, isn't it? Just mm -hmm. needs to sit a little flatter yeah. on there. See, now like we're almost yeah. perfect. I'm just hit a little bit more because I like it perfect. Just hit. What, what it's level, like how I am. What level of model does this level of hand attention go down to? Is this everything that comes out of here, or is this from like a standard series and upwards, or it's basically just customs we sh we hand shape anymore? Right. So yeah, we're so we're we're in an area of the factory that is very much about yes. the custom shop. Yeah, okay, we fine. used to do all of them like this back in the day, but mm. now we make too many. Yeah, yeah we make like yeah. two hundred a day. Yeah, we'll need probably hundred people doing this every yeah. day. Yeah, 
to make 200x. Um, like that. Remind me again just to reassure the people out there. This is just a demo neck, right? Yes. Or, yes. This is only so a demo. panic not when you're yes. buying your ten thousand dollar Martin Custom Shock Zar. I have not f***ed it up, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Unless it's going on his, but yeah. then it's his own neck. All right. So then when I get the radius down, I'll just draw my line so I don't touch it no more. Right. Then I'll have to redo it. Yeah. Just for visual. All right. Now we're going to do some filing. It's just a forty-nine rasp. So now we're gonna go down. It's got some teeth on it, that yeah, file, isn't it? Yeah, this is pretty good. You yeah. can feel it. It ain't gonna cut you, but it, it cool. grips. Yeah. So now this one is for the 10th fret. So now you can see how much Loads. I have to take off. Loads. See that big gap? Yeah. So I'm, this is where I said like, we cheat for how when you, I- How do you even know that's the 10th fret? Or do you just know? Because you've done well, like Well, usually you don't so have many. fret markers, but right. there ain't nothing on this one. Okay. Yeah, like- This is like these guys, these just, you could do this probably in your sleep. Yeah. See. This is like a custom that has to be shaped. So yeah. see, we'll have side dots, fret yeah. line, frets on them. This is just, I just yeah. throw a fingerboard on there. Yeah. It might have been garbage, I don't know. But it will be once it, I finish it. <laughs> it will be now, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can put the frets in there for no, you no, if you no, want. Honestly, no, you, All right. I can, I'm, I can do a lot of things, <laughs> man. All right, so this is, this is what I call like cheating. See how they scored yeah. it with the metal? So then this is where I want to take the, the meat off. So I just go down, and then this side I'll come up. Now I want to stay in like an inch to two inch area mm -hmm. so I don't get any hollows mm -hmm. and dips. Oh, it quite quickly starts mm -hmm. to yeah. lose like, the light, yeah. doesn't it? It goes there? fast. Yeah. That's why it's always take a little bit off and check. Because mm. if you just keep on going and you don't check, and then next thing you know it's too much. One little swipe can be too much. Then we just keep on going. Just like that. See, so it's yeah. just a little bit and, and yeah, check. Before you know it, you're kind of there, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yep. It yeah, don't take long. The long, the harder part is after we get all that and then, then we, we bring yeah, it all together. You blend it all together, yep. All right, you're all, it's, it's almost your turn. Right. I thought I got away with it then. No, no, no. <laughs> I only do it a little bit. So I'm using the flat side. Yeah? Yes. Yep, What's the, the point of the, the rounded side the then? The round side is for my heel. Ah, I'm doing see. this. So I can bring it all together. Okay. This is, you don't want to use a round and create a hollow. All right. That's yours. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm just doing maybe like mm -hmm. two or three. Yep. You can stand over here yep, if you want. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I've already it up. I can see, look. It's all right. I'll fix it. Yeah, you are, because I said two inches, you're going yeah. like three now. <laughs> he doesn't know it. Oh. Yeah, that's true. He thinks this one is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm nice. kind of, yeah. so what was that? Yeah, I mean, were we, have I taken too much off, or is no, that? No, you're fine. I'm okay. Yeah, you're all right. <laughs> this is cool, right? Mm -hmm. Hit down here. A bit more down yep. here. Uh, it's so, it's um, not relaxing. What's the right word? Therapeutic. Therapeutic. Thank you, Taylor. Oh, yeah, it is. It is, isn't it? I kind of feel like I'm not going, I'm, I'm being too weak. You know, like, I think if I had the confidence, mm -hmm. I see what you mean as well. I'm going way. Yeah, it's, it's all right. It takes a while to build up the confidence. Like, yeah, just I, to go at it. I'm every... not getting a job in the Martin Custom Shop anytime soon. I know that. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite certain that if you were to work uh, side by side with Mike for about two weeks, yeah. he could get you up to a level of competency yeah. and confidence. Well, we'll give you three next. If you don't you're make much. it on end, then you're not. I just want to, I just feel like I need a beard like yours, and then, I, and then I'd fit <laughs> then in You'll be automatically hired yeah. then. You're just, you're just working a custom shop. You don't got to do nothing. Just have the beard. Uh, see, we're getting there. We're nearly there. We're almost there, see? It's not okay, that hard. Then we'll bring, break out the draw knife. That's fun. We're not done though. We gotta okay, get the draw okay, knife. Okay, Hold okay. I'll finish this Go real on, quick. You finish it. Oh yeah. We'll go with this one. This one's a newer one. This is a shark. Look at that. All right. 
Now, you, they always tell you not to cut toward yourself. <laughs> there but we are. This is an exception. Yeah. Obviously, I don't have to tell you don't don't touch the blade. It's very yeah. sharp. You, you might... probably did have to tell me that. All right. I'll tell you again. No, don't, don't 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 touch the blade. It's very sharp. And we're gonna. This edge goes against the the neck, and yep. this is gonna the flat is towards us, and we're gonna pull it towards us. Mm -hmm. Try to work yourself from this side down here as you pull it towards you. Oh, I see. Yeah. That's see, now like... this ain't gonna go. Like, that's why it's better. I'm gonna have to spin this. This is the trick of that. It spins around. This is a great piece of kit. How long do you think this um, piece this of wood probably underneath? about 80 years old, I would say. No. I've been here, I've been using it for 17 years. And the person before me had it for like seven before me. I don't know, it was on a bench <laughs> somewhere. And we just pulled it out. And this is what they used to have on every bench. And they would whittle their own necks for every one. It's amazing. So let's see if this works. All right, here, that's better. See, that's a little direction. Now it ain't cutting like butter, but it's cutting. There, see so you go, like that. Do you have all your own, are you responsible for your own tools and mm -hmm. sharpening them yep. and all that kind of stuff? Yep. Yeah, this I is know a new one. Like. It came in sharp, so I had to sharpen it. Are you ready? Yeah. I'll, I'll help you out. Okay, so where Don't am I? Don't mind my hands, I'm no, gonna no, touch no. you. I'm fine with that. Oh, it's just something out of the coast. There you go, just like see, that. See, I've taken quite a lot off there, haven't yeah, I? Yeah, yeah, you take a lot off with this. That's why this is, this is like a real, this is a cooperating, just go on the other side. This, this operation right here, you need to pay close attention because one fell swoop, you gotta, you gotta ruin it. it. Yeah, you know what, man? It's it is. It's a I, I, keeping that same pressure as you go mm -hmm. down. I've taken way too much off it. Yeah, it's all right. I'm making the Ivaness Gem version of the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of the it's all right. We can have a toothpick neck. <laughs> yeah, it's. You know what? It's like. It's like you say. It's kind of. I don't know what I'm doing here. We call I that the bad. reverse mom steam. Yeah. It's scalloped <laughs> yeah, on the back Absolutely. Side. There you go. Yeah, it, it, yeah, so you gotta hold that whole same pressure all the way is, through. It is, that's what it is, isn't it? And, and yeah, again, there you go. Ah, nice. And it's almost like, as soon as you slow down, it's like you've it. well, excuse my language there, but no, it's like right. you, just gotta, around here. you just gotta keep it. I mean, these are great tools. I mean, I just think it's, you're really, you're really keeping alive that whole sense of making guitars how they were made mm -hmm. 100 years ago. You know, it's like, yeah, don't, don't, <laughs> this is not yeah, a great Yeah, we're doing example. that and we're still speeding up the process a little yeah. bit by having it somewhat machine. Oh, well, uh, I, I feel like I've, I feel like I've destroyed this enough now. I kind of do want to keep doing it though. Go it's, ahead. It's like. Have fun. Yeah, you just go and take some lunch and come back in a minute. This is how we, yeah. we uh, suck people in. Yeah. I can see there's like, this is, that Martin are making a how not to make guitars training video. <laughs> Everyone's watching, whatever you do, <laughs> don't, don't do, do like how he's doing it. Well, if you go too far, you'll, you'll end up hitting the rod slot. So we know yeah. you can just stop that. I kind of quite like, I'm sort of get, I am sort of getting into it though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, maybe not now. Oh, sorry, it's just the wood. Yeah, That's it's, how the wood is. Okay, so what, I mean, obviously let's pretend that I've done an amazing job there. What, what would the next phase be? Or is it down to sort of hand sanding? And yeah, no, it would be down to like hand, the filing. Right, more so filing. When you get that, then I'll break out this big one, this big uh, dragon file, and just, then I'll make it flat. Yeah. See how the, see all the rocking? So now yep. it's come in. Right. And then flatten it all out. Well, round flat, but make everything flat. Yeah. So you can get all those bumps and stuff out. Do you play? No. You don't I play? Don't. I can make a guitar, but I can't play one. I, do, I always find that fascinating, how many of the most famous guitar makers over the years didn't can't play. play. I yeah. know. I bet you make all your own furniture though, right? No. No? No. Just down at <laughs> Ikea. Believe it or not, I don't work on wood when I go home. Really? No, I, I tie flies. Fair enough. Yep, that, then I just keep on going and go yeah, to a yeah. different file and smooth them more out. Blend everything together. This has been the most fun I've had thanks so, so far much, on Mike. the Martin tour. Oh, no problem. Uh, thanks, Mike man. Mike was cool. Guitar maker extraordinaire. Yeah, that was amazing. Lee Anderson. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, thank you very much. And um, here it is after I finished it, see? <laughs> Ta-da. Ta he even fretted it and put it <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, I no, did the man. whole thing. <laughs> Here though, this is yours though. Here, you 
your souvenir. Oh, that's yeah, cool. Yeah, you get a souvenir to take with you. Thank you very much. Oh, that's very kind of you. Apparently this was made to celebrate, I think uh, Carmen was saying like the 200th anniversary of Nazareth. There's like a, or may, maybe even the 250th, but um, there's a picture of uh, some of the townsfolk dressed up in the original um, sort of dress that they would have worn when they first settled here. And then they've obviously made this absolutely enormous <laughs> Martin guitar uh, as part of that celebration. So we're going to uh, take a look through this Perspex screen at uh, Diane here, who's uh, scalloping the, the, the bracing on a, on a Martin guitar. Obviously all done by hand, but can you tell us a little bit about what's going on here? Sure, absolutely. So when the braces get glued on the surface of the instrument, um, they're tall and they're typically uh, dimensionally um, not optimized uh, for the, uh, the, the rigidity and the exact spots where mm -hmm. they need it. Uh, or the flexibility in other places. And so uh, what we do is we basically whittle, whittle them away um, to their minimal profile. And this is because uh, we want the instruments to be as responsive as mm -hmm. possible, uh, but we also want them to be structurally sound. Uh, if you take too much off uh, during this process, you could end up with a guitar that uh, the belly might pull, um, or it might not sound proper, or the, the, the brace tips might come loose, and then you have a funky rattle that'll yeah. So there's all sorts of pitfalls, um, but the biggest one is weakness, right? So these instruments have a lifetime warranty, so they have to be uh, strong enough to uh, to last for the owner's uh, uh, lifespan. Mm. And uh, we hope that many people actually, you know, make a companion well, out of this guitar forever. But the Sitka Spruce braces, um, their their strength in a, a, a perpendicular mm -hmm. uh, axis to the grain is um, largely determined by the height of the brace. And so for every, I think it's every 20% of height that you gain or lose, um, you can gain or lose 50% of the structural st stability of a and piece of wood. Presumably, because I was, as uh, Diane was doing that, I was thinking, well, why, why wouldn't you pre-shape the scallops before gluing them on? But it, is that because each different guitar is scalloped and it has its bracing scalloped in a different way? Exactly, and so right. certain models might uh, take braces that are the same length mm -hmm. uh, or are the same width and so they would come off of the machine you mm -hmm. know uh, to those dimensions but ultimately uh, they would need to be feathered down uh, feathered down to nothing the other mm. thing is like what we're doing right now feathering these these uh, tone bar tips down she's going to be able to get them down to where they're microns thin yeah. at the tips which you could never do you could you never were... do it on a machine no, it'd be right. impossible yeah um, is the, it the skill here? I mean, the, the confidence, the hand yeah. skill, it's incredible. I mean, I'm even looking where, where they're getting filed right back down to the, to the top. I'm, there's no evidence that there's like, she's missing a mark and scratching the top or anything. It's just like, it's amazing. No, over the years, uh, I'll be the first to tell you, I've braced a lot of guitar tops and I've gouged, yeah. I've gouged quite a few of them uh, along the way. But uh, when you, when you really, uh, develop this level of skill. Yeah, um, it's just a, it's a great thing to watch. It, it, yeah, amazing, truly. All right, so this is a the pearl inlay department in the custom shop. This is where some of the most exquisite pearl we do takes place. My coworker here, Chris, um, hey, is Chris. actually working. And Chris, you want to tell us what you're working on here? Give us a little explanation. This fingerboard here, every year China orders uh, a certain amount of guitars, between like 10 to 15 or so, of whatever animal it is that year. Oh yeah, it's, the, it's the Chinese so, year of the dragon, I think, isn't it? So yeah, yeah this following year is, or 2024 is gonna be year of the dragon. This year was actually year of the rabbit, so I just finished up a month Amazing. or two ago some of those. But this has been going on for several years. We've done oh at gosh, least the yeah. year of the horse, I remember, the year of the rabbit, and now year of the dragon. Yeah, I wanna say year, about year 12 year. years, maybe. I. I don't know. What I'm, year were you born? Uh, 74, so oh. I don't know what it would be. I was, I'm was. i 72, I was Year of the Rat. All right. Which, oh. I don't know if that sounds like, the rat, it always feels bad being Year of the Rat, but apparently he won the race <laughs> in the mythological things. So it's quite cool being. I mean, I must admit, we had an amazing day a couple of days ago at the PRS factory, looking at all the different inlays. Played the dragon guitar, you know, with a million different inlays. But these are, again, same kind of idea, all 
how are you cutting these? You got a laser machine or are you doing these by hand? Doing or? the shop bot. So shop bot's basically machining out the parts for me. Yeah. Um, basically cutting out also the pocket, which I'm inlaying them into. Oh my God, look at, I mean, so. that's some level of, wow. So that must, that's obviously done with a laser, right? No, it's same machine. So, what, so I'm creating the pocket. It's just, it took a long time to like So edit just like it. tiny blades, just uh, it's, it's drill bits of, even. Yeah, it's tiny basically drill bits. what it is. My God, that's clean. Sorry to... Yeah, no, I just have a few loose pieces. Uh, in there. And then you've just got what, like 150 pieces of inlay or something to lay in here. <laughs> it might be that. <laughs> wow. That's cool. I kind of feel like the UK needs we need like a year of the something or other just as an excuse to do this. Year of the fish and chip. That's what it is, year of the fish and chip. <laughs> <laughs> year of the haggis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, could you just do that? That would be amazing. Oh, that's beautiful. That's, and is that, that you're just doing inlays all day long? Yeah, uh, wow. pretty much, you know, between that and design, you know, whatever type of inlay. Yeah, I mean, it's beautiful. beautiful. This is just an interesting position. I mean, I actually grew up with Chris. We went right. to school yeah. together, and part of what we did is we were very intricate in models and cars, so. You know, yeah, I ended up in the sales, right back in the place, but really. you know, Chris uh, has always had that attention to detail. His father, everybody was into cars and really I precise you, things. So, um, again, we just spent some time at lunch chatting about this, and I guess it's a you have to you probably if you don't appreciate the sort of geography of Nazareth and the sort of the fact that it, you know it's not a massive city. You know, this, this so Martin's a really important employer in this area, and you've got second, third, fourth generations of employees. And th th you're, you're maybe the, I don't know, the third or fourth person that we've gone around and Carmen's gone, yeah, I, I've known so, this guy since I was a kid or, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, for us was big, like Chris and I are of the same age group. Eric Clapton Unplugged mm -hmm. played a big part in the expansion of the factory in about 1993. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us coming out of high school, college, yeah. hey, I graduated college, I was supposed to go into construction. Yeah. That's what my family was for. And then Chris, we ended up selling out two to three years, Lee, mm -hmm. when Clapton put his 00042 on Unplugged. Chris stood up at a quarterly meeting and said, look, I need to expand the business, I need leaders. And a lot of us sort of filled that gap. You know, we kind of had relatives that work here. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing. A lot of times different people uh, from families will have mm -hmm. their uh, siblings or other people they know come into work. So oh, that's good. cool. We all we all uh, really work good together and do the best we can to make this. It's not easy, obviously. I'll send you some fish and chip ideas for, <laughs> <laughs> for 20, cool me, 2024. <laughs> Limited stuff. See you, man. Good to, right, good thanks, to chat. Chris. All right. And then this area right here would be sort of the end of the custom shop. So all yep. these guitars right here are set to go somewhere, you know, somebody designed them, either uh, a dealer, a customer, or us at Martin. So a lot of different it's, stuff here. It's um, it's funny, it's not, I think in all the factories that we've been to, the custom shop, well, apart from Gibson, where they had a separate custom shop, private stock at uh, PRS and your custom shop, it's very much in amongst the floor. So apologies if we're sort of, when we've tried to do the sort of start to finish, we've had this sort of little custom shop sort of detour in the middle. Um, I think what we want to go and see now, though, are the body presses and yeah. where the bodies so, get put together for the standard series stuff. To Lee's point, it's kind of hard to go through production <laughs> and walk by the custom shop and not stop and check out what's going on. So we're going to take a, another piece over here to actually side bending. So now we're going to start to bend the sides, we're going to make yep. a rim, and we're going to start to look like uh, a guitar at this point. These are, my, these are some of my favorite processes. I, I know wood gets bent into different shapes for all yep. kinds of purposes, but it, it still always blows my mind. It's just like, I wonder who the first person who worked out that you could take relatively thin wood and bend and it into bend shapes, because it. it's, it's quite an unnatural thing for a piece of wood to do, isn't Definitely. it? Definitely. And, and over here, we're not running at the moment, but these are presses, again, built yep. by us. We always like to build our own sort of components. They're pressure, uh, temperature controlled, we built them in house. That's where most of the press bending would happen. Mm -hmm. Now, again, if we would start to get into something where the bend would be too hard, or let's say a flame type of wood that needs to go into a cutaway bend and it's too much, they would actually get on here with the, with the press and actually do it almost the same the way they would have at the North Street factory using the same type so of tool. These are what, interchangeable? 
um, molds, yep. are they? So that you yep. just load in whatever you yep. want to do. So you're looking here, Lee. You know, yep. you got your triple oh, okay. 12 fret, you have a D14 fret, oh, so it's a, a J14, different machine a double O. So every one of them is built into the contour I see. No, of the side. Okay, so I was thinking this bit might be removable, but you're saying each machine is, yep. a, is a certain shape. Yep. And then now to that point, it is. You could make two 14 fret if you wanted. You can interchange them, but it depends on what's and, coming through. And is the machine um, the sole part that's heating the wood up, or is the wood preheated, put okay, it in, so and then heat wise, yes. But before it goes in there, it's going to go into that soaking kettle. Uh, I see. So the strange thing is, is this looks yes, old school. You literally put the Can side I, right uh, in there. Are we sort of saying this part of the process probably hasn't changed in correct 200 years? Yep. Yep. And what's what is that in there? It's like a uh, it's water, and I want to say it's a saline solution at some right. point. I'm not really a hundred percent sure what else goes in there, but um, you know they'll drop the side in there for five minutes or so. Mm -hmm. My time might not be exactly right. And a lot of people are like, "Well, if you dry the wood yeah, in what? the kill, now well, you're putting it in the soaking the same. Yep. water. Why would you do that? Just remember that." Um, wood cells close, mm -hmm. okay? And I like to say there's free floating moisture in the mm -hmm. wood and there's bound moisture into the cell. Mm -hmm. So a five minute drop will put moisture into the wood lead but not get into the cell. Right. Okay. That allows it to bend without mm -hmm. actually affecting the humidity content. Right. Long term. So by the time it comes out, gets I the mean, family and, and there it is. is. I mean, it's yeah, a lot of bending, this, oh, you sorry, know? Man. Yeah, I mean, you. And that's what it's an SC13, yep. isn't it? It's got some of the most, uh, some of the biggest bends in there. No but, doubt. I mean, it's just mad. And if this was, if this was unglued, would these strips try to return to their yes. natural shape so sort of over time? That's a good question. Let's take a walk over here and I'll show you what we do to keep that from happening. See what she's doing here. This uh -huh. is a really unique piece because the sides want to relax. Although you bend them, yeah. you have to keep consistent geometry from part to part. Yeah. So she's right now she's installing the, the front block and the rear block. Mm -hmm. The front block I like, I consider that the heart of the guitar. That's something mm -hmm. about Martin guitar we really pay a lot of attention to. You strike the strings on a guitar lead, the energy goes both ways. Yeah. Goes up to the nut, down through the saddle. Mm -hmm. The energy that goes through, through up up the fingerboard gets dumped if you're fretting or it goes into the nut if it's open mm -hmm. and all of that energy then comes back down through the neck and has to be transferred from here into the body mm -hmm. what happens here is critical that's why we like the compound dovetail neck joint we like a tight joint in there we like to make sure everything is as solid as it possibly can be including the way the uh the purfling is butted up against the uh the uh, front block. But if you see right there, she has one, it's coming out of there. She has both of those blocks installed. What's the drying time on that glue? 30 minutes. 30, 30 minutes, yeah. But still a lot less than what you would normally yeah. think. So synthetic glues and their ability to dry have come a long way and yeah. we like to take advantage of that. You know, this is always the stage at which you start to feel like, okay, it's coming together now. Yep. Um, always one of my favorite parts this is where you make your, uh, so this, what happens coasters. here, this is where the uh, serial numbers actually become engraved on the block. Okay, right cool. Here. So one thing you're gonna get is the Martin Company logo. You're gonna have the model number and the serial number. That's gonna take place on this laser. Now, you would get a, um, a Martin Authentic Series guitar that would be built in the custom shop and your serial number would be stamped with the original stamp. So See, somebody we, would actually be there yep. stamping the number on. That's what we saw. I think we, we were talking about that at North yep. Street this morning, weren't we? One yep. of the, one of the uh, parts that you try and keep true to the, the original way of making the stuff. Onwards and upwards. Onwards and upwards. So again, we're starting to get to the phase of building a body and what we're doing here is installing the ribbon lining. You can see he's using, we haven't really graduated from the clothespin, right? It's uh, it's good because it just gives the right amount of pressure and we always use a lighter wood in here, sort of like cedar or balsa mm -hmm. wood uh, because that wicks glue very well. And at the same time, it's a little soft, so we don't want to put any dents into it. But this is going to be the surface area now that we're going to glue the top and back to. Uh -huh. So now we're at the point where the top and back are going to be glued on. One thing that's going to have to happen before it comes over here is it's going to go in these forms. 
Right. Because you remember, you're, you're going to have the wood. The wood is going to relax yeah. a little bit, and uh, we want to make sure the geometry from part to part is absolutely consistent until the top and back are glued on. So in the form it goes, comes over these, here. These must be really expensive to make. Like, as in the, just the forms. So, I mean, imagine some of these forms are, you know, old, because why would you I mean, remake them? Started with wood, you know, then yeah. it went from wood to actually high pressure laminate over to aluminum. Right. With at the end of the day, aluminum just holds the spec yeah. right where yeah. it needs to be. Yeah. So. so once it goes into the form, a lot of people may not realize this, but from the sound hole forward is a slight drop angle. I think it's about three or four degrees, but. Okay. It, that angle is there to obtain proper bridge and saddle height. If we wouldn't put that angle on there, you'd have a lot of thin bridges and a lot of thin yeah. saddles just due to the geometry. So this is another machine that's been made in house. It goes into the form, and as it comes out here, it's actually putting it, that it angle. Sanded drop. the angle. Yep. On, right? Yep. And that's on the, the the front or the back of the guitar. Do you the front, the front, on the yeah. top. Okay. So right from the sound hole leaf forward yeah, yeah, yeah. is that little bit of drop that he has sanded in. It's gonna come over here. They're gonna keep it in the form. They're gonna do a physical inspection because remember, once you glue the top and back on, you can't get your hands inside to fix anything. Um, we're starting to see these type of lights a lot of reflective lighting so people can see what they're working on because now we're getting into some areas where finishing and things could really so, start to show up and hey give us problems. So I guess here we go, we're gonna see one being yep. glued on. Yep. This is, um, we saw this process happening in custom shop, didn't we, this yep. morning? Yep. So it, it doesn't, uh, What's really different here? Is it a different Not kind of glue? Not much other or? than, of course, the high glue portion so of it. Right. Not much in terms of the way that the press comes down. Obviously, on those older authentics, they'll use the original press, but yep. it's just an operation of getting it together. Now, what could go a little different, too, he's still going to pocket his stuff out. Those guys are going to do that by hand more, mm -hmm. but he's going to use his template to route out where the brace pockets oh, are gonna that's go. Right, yeah. That's where the braces yeah. are gonna run into it. Making HD28s here by the looks of yep. things. A great guitar. There you go. Beautiful, thank, thank you. So this is a interesting part of the company at production area where we're going to start to install the binding. A lot of people think that's yeah. ah, an ornate type of thing. It looks good to have a binding on the edge of the guitar, but in reality, it's to keep dense because everybody knows the soft side of wood is like that. So if you go back years ago, Lee, and people are riding on horses, you know, they're getting their guitars dented, a lot of scratches. So they would say, hey, can you put something on I've, the corner? I have asked. Every single factory that we've been on so far, why do you put binding on a guitar? And in fairness, they've been on electric guitars, so maybe it's uh, different, but they've all just gone because it looks nice. But you're saying it, uh, that makes so much sense. Yep. So it's, it, yeah, yep. you're right, because the edges, I suppose, would be where the dings would go. Yep. And it just gives that little extra bit of protection. Yep. There you go, you learn something new every day. A couple ways to do it. One is by hand with these collars. Um, that's what Mercedes is doing over there, the handwork, but also, we also do it this way, which is, is one of our newest machines where it actually really does a great job in terms of getting that depth right. One thing you have to think about when you're routing that channel out, mm -hmm. that starts everything in terms of how thick or thin your side yeah. or binding can be. So, so this is just doing the routing, right? It's yes. Not, not, yes. The, the actual application the of the application binding is still by hand. The application takes over here. It's this yeah. piece here. One of the most difficult uh, you know, jobs in production is getting that channel so consistent yeah. from part to part. Yeah. It makes you think, doesn't it? Before we had all this kind of equipment, getting the channel that you would put the binding on would have been such a precision. Precision lean, you gotta figure if you got it wrong, your coworker right next to you is gonna have yeah. to come back because they're not gonna be able to do their job. But at this point, we, we've been able to really get it the tolerance is down to where yep. it needs to be, and that really makes a big difference in a lot of ways. And then once that channel's routed in the side, it's time to put the binding on. 
So you can see here, it's it's a manual process of using yeah. tape. You have to get that binding on as tight as do, possible. Do you know, in, in every guitar factory we've been in so far, if there's any part of the process that requires a really high uh, dexterity, it's all the, it's always ladies doing it. Yeah. It's just so, like. <laughs> you know, I got to tell you, Lee, that's a that's a really good point about women that work in the factory. Uh, this area locally in Nazareth was big for garments and clothing, mm -hmm. and that industry went dead. My grandmother worked down the street. You can actually see the factory, which was an old garment factory. It yep. went out of business, and um, she came to Martin Guitar for a job. Yeah. And her job was on marquee strings to actually yep. wind that little silk. And a lot of these women were able to come in here, sit down, yep. and do the job immediately. Yep. So there is a lot of dexterity, a yep. lot of uh, diversity in our workforce. It really does work. And, and this job's important because as tight as you think that is, yep. when we would get back to spring and we would put lacquer mm. on, you still could see a pinhole or when, something. When you've got these multi-ply um, bindings mm -hmm. on, is that pre-formed like that before you put it on or look, is it look actually what she's doing. You can see right there multiple she's doing layers. that. See that. She's you, checking the depth now, right? Because yeah. she knows that the so depth how, isn't right, that's not going to work is that for her. Two or f how many pieces of binding is that? So this is just two pieces. So it's two pieces. And what, what's the most that you would, you know, when you're building up some of those multiply ones, what's the most that you might, or is it is two kind of the Usually maximum? two I've been doing. Right. They could go up to five though. Can they? Like right there's a couple examples of how they're and stacked they're five together. five separate pieces that have got to be sort of. Yep. Glued on yep. together. Yes. Wow. Absolutely. Because it's like the natural daylight, I'm guessing, really helps here as well, because you've got to be able to see in really high detail, haven't you? What are these three piece backs going to end up being where they've gone from the, uh, I don't know, what is that? Like a maple walnut. Is that what we were seeing in the custom yes, shop? So these yep. are stuff that we yep. probably won't see in the shops until next Correct. year. Yep. 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 Because that's not on an SC13 though, is it? No. So this is just a new... Yep. Well, there you go, you saw it here first, yeah. maybe. <laughs> this is gonna be a first fit on this one. What model is this one? Is it a... Basically, he's gonna do the first round of neck fitting. He's gonna get the geometry as close as he can. So the neck fitting operation at final assembly doesn't have to do a lot of hand cutting. We don't mm -hmm. like to use chisels on polished lacquer. Yep. I always think, again, we, we, we saw this, um, well, in fact, we've seen this at, uh, at Gibson and PRS. Mm -hmm. Just, if this is probably the most critical part of the whole build now, because you, you get this a fraction of a millimetre wrong, and the neck's not sat right, the bond isn't strong, um, and it amazes me, again, that, that I guess the technique is here, is every neck is built where the join is fractionally too big for the uh, socket, That's so right. it's down to the operator to make yep. the adjustments you're seeing now. Yep. You know, just like a, a few shaves, that's all it is. Like yep. just until it's just that perfect fit. Yep. And it just, again, it's one of those processes that I don't think you could ever automate because it, it's down into, you know, unique microns for each neck carve, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it a lot going on. He's got a lot to work with. He also has to put a heel cap on it. Right. And that plays a part. You don't want the heel cap not to line up with the binding. No, sure. You know, so if you look right there, he's got it cut, the heel cap. There he you, got, you, you got this, Lee. You got yeah. forward, sideways, and then the twist. Yeah. That's that's the, Those are the geometry angles yeah. he has to play with. But yeah, you got to know. You, I mean, look, you, you and I, are, in fact, all of us are massive lovers of how uh, this technique of manufacturing a guitar. But you can see why builders try and do a bolt-on, can't you? Absolutely. It's like, you know, it's like, it, 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 it removes uh, all of this. Um, but I guess the, the argument is, it's not the same connection, is it? It's not the same connection between the neck and the body. But yeah, that's right. Oh look, you know, everybody will make their choice, won't they, as to what works for them, but. Yeah. There we 
go. So you said this is just first fit. So what yeah. um, what needs to be done then after this guy has so, you know got the, the, the tight fit? It, it you know once we start to put finish on the guitar mm -hmm. or do some things, it could move a little bit. Right. You know so that final fitter is going to have to get it back on that, get it back on the pattern. Yeah. Make sure that you know he's taking a lot less off than he is. Yeah. You know so he's going yeah, to have to get it. He's just taking lacquer off. You know, and stage. remember our conversation about how important communication is. Mm -hmm. if he's not doing his job. He, you know, the person that's in final assembly is going to see mm -hmm. it. So they have mm -hmm. to constantly be making sure that everything that's leaving is in uh, mm -hmm. the right, the right geometry and spec. And up there is another one of our friends' guitars. <laughs> so they're coming through. See that? The, so you know, we saw the um, the John Mayer with the inlaid uh, scratch plate. That's the twenty thousand dollar one. So the 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 the, slight, the more affordable one has a regular stick on scratch plate. But yeah, if you really really want to be a Uber John Mayer fan, how many of those are you realistically going to make though? I mean, a month, say. Oh man, I, I can't. I don't even know. It's going to be like what less than fifty? Yeah, I mean, you got to figure. I probably have two or three a month going into Europe and UK. Is that all? Yeah. So it's way less than fifty. I mean. It's, well, for the world, it could be 50, right? Yeah. Now, that's a month. Yeah. So I might get, I don't know, 10, 15 of them into Europe and UK, maybe, I don't know by when. That one's a tough but one. What, what I mean is, so we've seen four of these now. Right. So we've probably seen 10% of the total yeah, production already. Yeah, that's true. Already. That's true. Yep. Um, so there's, a, there's, there's maybe even a one in 10 chance that the one that comes to Anderton's will be one of the ones that we saw, which would be cool. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so fretting next then, yep. okay. So again, you're, you're fretting the fret boards before they're glued to the, the yep. neck. I guess yep. that's a definitely. pretty normal yep. technique for this, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, all done by hand. Presses and little hammers and stuff. Yeah. And yep. You got to get that bevel on there, it's right? It's good to, yeah. I mean, it's. I think as a player, it's the first thing you feel, isn't it? When you yep. when you run your hands up and down the the neck is like you know what are the what are the fret ends and yep. what are the edge of the fret feel, feel like. Um, so it's good to see that. There's obviously a lot of attention to detail here. No doubt. Hmm. So I would say we're, through production, we're a little bit more than halfway. We're starting to get into the finishing department. <laughs> Got some Anderton fans here. So this is the pre-finishing area. Again, this is the last operation before we spray lacquer on and start the finishing process. So you can kind of see on these leaves, some of them are done, like right now. You see how he's doing the sound hole? He's gonna sand the sound hole, get the bevel on that. All the edges are gonna be rounded to spec. He's gonna do a lot of visual too. So he's gonna get it up in the lights, any knots, anything that could be left on the guitar is gonna do you, be sanded do you put down. A, do you put a, a grain filler or anything on we these do. before we'll they I'll show you that. That's a big part of what Martin does in the finishing component, so. I was just watching you guys on lunch. Ah, tremendous. How's it going, man? My name's Lee. Gus, nice to meet you. Hey, good. Uh, so, you guys come through right after I was watching. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? So he's got his Brian May uh, biography book here. Um, so yeah, what goes on? What's so, going on here? This is the the pre-finished department, not for bodies, but for necks. So mm -hmm. this gets quite important because he's going to give the final sanding touches, so all these, the these edges. Are, these are fret, yeah. So these are fretted. Yep. Necks now. Yep. Cool. And it, all just just a, a final look, by, by, all done by eye. Just a little. Yep. Well, and once we're done softening everything up up here, I'll take it up to the sanding station, give everything a nice 320 finish, and then send it on to uh, be filled and uh, the stamp. He's being uh, humble <laughs> because you got to think he's got to he's got to blend everything in. Yeah. Right. So what you feel is how he sands it. That's yeah. really where we're at at the point where if you feel something in the neck, he's responsible for the way the neck is shaped. I you see I love this. I love that just that little rolled sense. 
it feels good in the hand. Yeah. Get your fingers in the position. You know? <laughs> it's still, yeah. It feels like the fretboard comes a lot further off the end of the necks than on other guitars I've seen. I guess this is all about getting the contact between the fretboard and the heel yep. joint. These have all got the truss rod adjustment from yep. up inside the sound hole, right? Anyway, look, it's beautiful. Thank you very right. much. It's good Thanks. to meet you. Thank you. So now we're into the finishing department. This is this is where I was born. This is my yeah. my area of expertise. Um, We've seen a lot of scraping this week, and yeah. that's another one of those like uh, you just got to have such a high degree of hand-eye coordination and an attention to detail. Yep. Yeah, every operator is responsible for their tool sharpening, so yeah. they have to do that. Now, this is unique because we choose to do it the real old way. Mm -hmm. So there's no UV fillers or anything like that. We use the old school linseed pour filler. So what is linseed pour filler? So the job looks like this. Let's look at this sample here, right? Okay. You paint the mud on. Doesn't that look dirty? Seriously? You paint it, Lee. Feel that. So, uh, sorry, so every guitar that we've seen so far that looks beautiful and almost finished then gets covered in this yep. brown goop. Yep. Okay, and what now, is it? It's a linseed? It's a linseed pore filler. Okay. Now, why? Is that, is that dissimilar to the kind of linseed oil that you might put on a cricket bat? Yeah. Do you know what cricket is? Just check. Yeah, I do, actually. <laughs> I don't play it, but I... So, the, so there's an element of it's a filler and yep. a, like a nourisher type thing? Why or? I like it, Lee, is this is what it looks like when you buff it off. You yeah. hear the buffers over there, yeah. so you take a buffer, you go over it, it really packs that filler in there. Okay? Yeah. Now, I like it because this type of filler gets into the grain. Yeah. So if you think about it, it permeates into the wood and does have an effect on the way the wood resonates. Mm -hmm. So we want a material in that pour that accents the wood and behaves like wood. Mm -hmm. We don't want a concrete sealer on no. there that gets in and starts to do that. The other thing this process does is really brings out the grain of the wood nicely. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a Martin D18 like he plays, mm -hmm. you can actually see the grain enhancement in the side of the mahogany. Yeah. If you look at maybe a guitar that used a, a UV filler or something else that didn't have color to it, it's a very plain looking piece of mahogany. And is this, um is this sort of uh, paint, or what, I, I know yep. it's not paint, is that go on the back of the necks as well? Yes, yep. So, and that essentially, yep. when we see in the scraping, that's they're scraping yep. it off of the They're the cleaning binding. it, so yeah. you can see they got the filler on there, but they have to clean all the white bindings off. Yeah. So the, this guitar here, that's, has that been, that's had it buffed off already? Yep. Yeah. There's so many like crazy fiddly processes, aren't there? Oh! Yeah. <laughs> I'll take these. <laughs> He's been in the Yay! spray booth a little too long. Absolutely. Lee. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> He's uh, first generation. <laughs> Just never escaped. I literally just watched the new video. What one were you watching today? The you and. Uh, Lucky Chapman. I don't. Oh, I didn't even know what video we've released today. So it's, it's like, whatever uh, today's one is. You had like 500 pounds. You got a Gretsch and you had unlimited everything. The cards where we pulled yeah. up. Yes. Yeah. I basically people will think that's fixed because I just basically pulled out the most expensive card every time. So it's never fixed. <laughs> hey man. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So what? Cool. Yeah. What's happening here? So. You know, we spray nitrocellulose lacquer, and one thing you're going to learn in guitar construction is once you spray finish on things, mm -hmm. you start to see all kinds of things, Lee, that you weren't able to see in raw wood. Whether it's pinholes, sometimes you get a piece of dirt on yeah. it. So after every spray application, we have to do inspection. <laughs> How's it going? Thank you very much for coming in. Cool. But, you know, these, these operators are looking at any of that. Just anything like maybe there he's working on some pores that might be too deep that he's leveling you might find a piece of dirt a pinhole mm -hmm. anything in pearl for instance sometimes can be a little uh not not easy to work with they'll they'll take care of anything that needs to happen here over there my coworker Cindy, she's working on his coloring so they'll do a lot of shaded tops a lot of the spray paint for the mm -hmm. john mayer guitars anything that needs color is put on by that group of folks thanks Did I you, yeah sure 
Now this is crazy. And Do you, you want, and me. 100%, 100%. Like you said, a lot going on here. Finishing brings up all kinds of Wait, little where things. Where did the actual finish? We didn't see the, okay, the spraying. So is that like, I know it's- We'll get it on the other side, but okay. just real quickly, we have manual boosts over here. Those are manual spray mm -hmm. boosts. And then two robotic areas. Oh yeah, I can see it now. I can see yep. the, the, where the um, extractor. Yep, uh, that's, a, that's a clean off chamber. So okay. again, when the guitars go in there, the operators are gonna blow everything off and they're gonna turn that on. It'll go up in the dust collection, right. they'll wipe the body off. You have to wear a, a lab coat to go in there. Mm -hmm. We don't want dirt in that room. Now we're in the finishing area, so. Okay, you can see basically what's happening here. We start off with four coats of lacquer. We like very light sealers just to keep the oils of the wood where they need to be. Yep. And then we'll start out with four coats of lacquer. That four coats of lacquer will dry, come out, and we will sand 50% of the pores off. That's what you see right here. What's up, These, how you doing, Joe? Good. All right, man. These will go back into the spray booth. They'll get another two coats on them. Oh, we'll then smooth. sand all the pores out. Then goes back in for another two coats. So it's probably about eight coats in total of lacquer on here, probably two sanding operations and probably about 72 hours, I would say, for the final dry time on it. What do you, in terms of thinness of lacquer, what do you think you end up with after that? About five mils, about right. five thousand. About That's five, about five optimal for us, we really mill. like that. Yeah. Um, it's really something we pay attention to. I'll, I'll show you a little bit later I, how we actually measure I mean, that. I, I do think, I do think it is incredible, and I suppose ultimately probably why you still use nitro is, is that sense of you do get that rich gloss, but it is unbelievably thin in yep. a way that probably no other type of lacquer really. I mean, nitro is an interesting component because people don't realize this, but it's actually porous. Yeah. You actually get it under a microscope and look at it, it's porous, it breathes. So you gotta think about how that affects the wood itself. If you want a consistent seasoning or drying of the wood, mm. you don't wanna just dry it on the inside, you kinda wanna let it breathe out too, yeah. and I think that's part of it. And there's always that fun stuff with lacquer, Lee, as you know, where the longer it ages and dries, the better it sounds. So yeah. well, that's, that's always that fun, type right? of lacquer, right? Yep. If you yep. use nitro. More, more, yep. um, Modern lacquers obviously don't so, have that, do they? You're right, and we do use two types of lacquer. Okay. Now, typically the Martin Standard units, the 18s and above, will get the full nitro package, but if you look at like our Road Series guitars, Lee, or even some of the necks we use, we use what's called the catalyzed lacquer, which still has some of the components mm -hmm. of nitro, but relies on a, a sort of bonding process with a catalyst to get it together. It's a little bit more stiffer, a little bit more scratch resistant, a little more slipperier, because mm -hmm. we kind of like that for the neck mm -hmm. too. So every finishing package we have has been uh, sort even, of put in place for Even just for the, the, the guys watching, so even guitars that look like they haven't got a lacquer on them, where they've got that satin finish, yep. that is still a lacquer on it though, isn't it? So in some cases it would be. So for instance, um, a, a D, let's say a D41, which doesn't have a gloss neck, but a satin neck, that would be satin lacquer, Yeah. right? But if you would get down to a D28, that would be catalyzed lacquer. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that the finish component on the neck isn't nearly as important. It's important, but not yeah. as important as the body. So the D28 would have the full nitro, the neck would have the, the catalyzed lacquer package. Right. Cool. And drying's everything, of course, you know, you gotta get the, the, the solvent out of the guitars. That's what's happening in this room here. Some Mayer guitars back there, if you take a look. One of the first jobs I started at Martin Guitar was polishing, okay? The buffers have a lot of vibration, which cause mm -hmm. a lot of the repetitive motion injuries with their hands. Um, we wanted to move away from the manual process to robots, and it started, I think, with PRS, who actually had one of the first robots. Mm -hmm. We had one second. I was actually working back here with a coworker of mine and we could not get this thing to work, Lee. <laughs> I mean, you would put a you would put a, a body on it, you would run it, and as soon as the pad would wear down or any slight deviation in geometry in the body, it would grab the body and smash it on the floor. Wow. And we tried and tried, we couldn't get it to work. And then one day, on public tour, this guy comes through, this little Italian guy, and says to me and my coworker, 
what's this over here? He sees it and says, I have a company that does integrations and I think I can make this work. And we're like, I don't know about that. So we ended up going down to New Jersey and his company and what the guy had was a big company. We walked in, he had cells like this and they were doing the scratch patterns on stainless steel appliances. Yeah. And we're like, okay, you're working with metal. How's this gonna work? His technology was this. Look very closely right here. Do you see this moving back and forth yes. ever so slightly? Yeah, 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 yeah. The technology is in the shaft. So he developed a, a proprietary type of application where it's torque sensitive. And he's able to really get a close piece on how that is up there. And they come off almost 95 and in some cases 100% polished as if somebody would have did it by hand. So it's been pretty mm -hmm. successful. That for is us. successful. And now everybody's using it too. So that guy was pretty, I think if I remember correctly, he was involved in some other brands and getting these, uh, these, this equipment in here. This is a nice wall, isn't it? Gives you some sort of context of just how important, you know, Martin, and I always love it when I see Fender and Gibson kind of equivalents of this and you just think it's just, these instruments have obviously inspired so many people to write yep. so many amazing songs. Amen. So now we're into the Martin repair department. Um, oh, so this is where Dave Dahl would normally be. No, well, Dave Dahl used to be here until they threw him out, but no, I'm just <laughs> kidding. And Dave Dahl threw me out of here. I was here before him, but this is a really, really special area. It really requires a special set of skills because these guys have to learn to take guitars apart, right? You put them together yeah. over here, but you gotta take them apart over here. And a successful repair always revolves around how successful taking the guitar apart is. Well, so. I, well you know, I've got, I've got a, a D35 yep. from 1972 that came back to you guys. It was through here. Because the, um, it just, it didn't sound right and I didn't really understand why, but we were so lucky that Dave came around the store, yep. tried it and just went, your um, bracing is, is uh, coming loose. Yep. So you guys had it back and I never saw what happened, but obviously you've managed to take the top off, re-glue it, reset the neck. I think you even re-fretted it, to be honest with you. It was yep. like a gift. And um, honestly, you just get, you, the guitar comes back, just looks brand new. Well, obviously, I mean, if it's got scratches on it and stuff, it still did, but the, the, the basic guitar was like brand new. And the tonal difference, and this is, I mean, you know, half of me wonders how many guitars are there out there that are 50, 60 years old and the owner's kind of given up on it because it maybe doesn't sound great. And you think, it's all it needs is some needs. TLC from in here. Yeah. Yeah. Once you get the, ge you gotta yeah. get the geometry straightened out on it. The scale lengths have to come back into where they need to be. Everything happens on a neck reset like that. So these guys will tell you, once we get a guitar, we do a neck reset and straighten that out. It really mm. is a different guitar yeah. Yeah. at the end of the day. Yep. Yeah. And, and they got work a double on, neck up they there. They work on that. anything, Lee. Yeah. So, you see it? Yeah. yeah. Show us what you're working on, guys. So we, we have a C3 here from 1931. 31. So we're converting it to an OM45 Deluxe. Yeah, what? The holy grail of Mark guitar. Yeah. What, what, is that, so, what is that conversion So it was an arch top. And it was we, an arch top? Yep. Yeah. So if you want to, you can check it out. I'll grab the, the original top. Holy moly, so this isn't even really a repair as such, is it? I mean, this is a, we, this is a conversion. Conver yeah, we do conversion. There's the yeah, original wow. top, arch top. Yeah. So think about it, Lee. The real gem in all this is this wonderful old growth Brazilian rosewood yeah. that you can't get. And what, what's happened to the top here? Was this damaged like this when it came in? Yeah, or just... it, was, it was damaged and we just cut this off so, yeah. so that we could save, not do anything with the block. Oh, I see. Yeah. We don't yeah, really yeah, have yeah. the infrastructure to make yeah. large pops. So, <laughs> so a lot of flat pops. Are there, so. so yeah, so it got a little more of a curve to it. So basically what? saving the Brazilian and making it. And apart from stripping this back, have you had to do much to the, the body on this? Yeah, well, yeah. new top, we were we had prepared to fix the, everything, the yeah. Life. Yeah, crack, a couple cracks, uh, loose braces. Because so you obviously, on this one you can, because it's got a sound hole, but some mm -hmm. of those other ones just have the F holes, so right. we can't get in there. So when we do something like this, we can get in there and we can fix anything that's and, loose. And what's the neck that's going to go back on this? Uh, this is the neck. 
So you made a new neck here. New neck, yeah. Yep. Yep. Brazilian rosewood. Is that the old neck? No, that's, oh, a different, that's a different, different thing, guitar, yeah. yeah. So what he's basically kept keeping here is just the back and sides and, and yep. some of the internal bracing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I'm seeing it. <laughs> that's amazing. There's, and there's the original neck. Oh, fabulous. Yeah, so he gets to keep the original neck as yeah, a sort of a mem yeah. memento as and well. You can see the angle on it so much harder because of that yeah. curved top. So, yeah. And this was from the 1930s? 1931, yeah. 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 Wow. So that's our conversion, yeah. We're that's cool. It. Do you guys get all excited when you get jobs like this that come through? Because they're presumably time. fairly infrequent. Yeah, these are, well, uh, I mean, so we do like every other repair shop. You do your Fred jobs, yeah. you do your crack repairs, and all the other stuff. Yeah, these are just so more. These, these are very exciting for us. Yeah, these are more like highly detailed, really paying attention. So it's yeah, more of a challenge involved, especially it's well, not brand new. What's so. the. But you, do you guys all typically have to have done a certain amount of years in the regular shop and then you come into the repair thing once you're so experience yeah, is these definitely are all veterans back yeah. Yeah. brilliant experience let, is key. let me see the double neck yeah. just because who doesn't want a double neck acoustic to badly play wanted dead or alive on yeah. oh, it's got no strings otherwise i would have played it for you. <laughs> <laughs> you can do air wow. guitar air guitar yeah <laughs> so what's this in for this is uh this is ours Okay. We own it, it's just an extra one for the museum. So I just blew some cracks on it, the bridge was loose. Br all Brazilian rosewood again, all probably? All Brazilian. Yeah. Yep. Yep. See, Nin I'm getting good at this now. <laughs> like 1910? <laughs> I knew that. Nin <laughs> we'll turn that back, I mean. Yeah. Seriously, 1910. Yeah. Yeah. Think of they the were doing double neck guitars in 1910. Think yeah. of the size yeah. of the tree yeah. lead that was required to make is it one the width of oh, this. Oh, I see. Just, yeah. I believe this is this is single pieces. Yeah. This is a two piece back. Possibly, yeah. Could mm -hmm. be, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Give you that back. That's very, very cool. Yeah, cool. Very, yeah, very, very. Who nice. knew they were that cool in 1910? Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> that's how cool they were, man. We didn't yeah. know. We All didn't right. know. YouTube wasn't around. This is true. <laughs> Thanks, it's good to meet you. Now. So, so I didn't meet. That Pete bought a guitar magazine with him to the, to the US, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm reading it, and there's an article on these Martin electric guitars. And I, I said to Pete, I didn't even know you ever made electric guitars. So, so now you even have one, yeah, so or half is, of one. This is a, a 65 uh, GT70. So a pair of DR Mons, three-way switch, Bigsby, obviously, so, yeah. This is the headstock that went with it. Wow. So the most unmartin like headstock you can find, and, and that's, yeah. That's, what that's almost doing. like a Dean, yeah, like, uh, yeah. like dime bag Daryl style headstock or something. The, head, but. the headstock was broken off the guitar, so we had to glue everything back. We put, pulled the, mm -hmm. the head plate off, Brazilian head plate, pulled that off, put dowel rods in to kind of give it extra strength, and we kind of so put what, it all back it, together. This is a, it's not a center block guitar, is it? It's just a completely hollow? Yeah. C, Carmen. We just need to convince Chris to bring these back. I think people would dig these. Maybe comment section below. Whoa. Should Martin guitars get back <laughs> into the electric guitar market or should they leave it well alone? Comment. Well, I can <laughs> show you the solid body and that might change your mind on everything. No, it so. won't. It'll just, <laughs> it'll just make me want it more. That was a good one. <laughs> it's the worst headstock I've ever seen. Isn't it? Well, I, is it though? It's like a little Smurf headstock. Um, so neck through body. That. Oh, that's a weird neck. Yeah, I'll see it's, a, oh, it's just glued on. I see what it's you got mean. The... I don't know. I mean, this is like, yeah, maybe I'm, maybe the semi acoustic was better. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. it's kind of cool. So where did you, this, does this belong to the shop or is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. These, these are all shop guitars that I got in here, so. Look at the way the, the uh, machine heads are fanned out like that. I kind of like it. It's kind of it's kind of groovy. But look at the, I mean, this gives you some idea of what happens in the sunlight over the years. Cause you know, this which would have been under the truss rod cover would have been the uh, original. Yeah, it doesn't know, even really take a lot of time for the, the traditional nitrocellulose yeah. will turn pretty quick. MTV guitar and then... Was this to celebrate some sort of MTV Unplugged? Well, that was when they did the Unplugged. So that's but, kind of what got the rejuvenated, the whole acoustic guitar market is when MTV mm. started doing the, uh, the Unplugged series. Yeah, I mean, that, that was your Beatles moment, that one, wasn't it? It kind of was. All of a sudden, everyone wants to play acoustic. Aluminum that's inlay. Pretty. Wow. So. What was that for? Just a, some special anniversary? 
I don't even, nah, this was, this was a, a, a limited edition that we had done for. So you're about to see pretty much the penultimate part of, of, of this guitar's journey before it gets to bridge gluing and final assembly. And that's where the guys are fitting the necks. We kind of saw the first fit. Yep. We talked a little bit about just how important it is that each unique neck join is done, uh, you know, one at a time. And so he's going to fit a Street Master. Just, just remember on the Street Master, that's a simple dovetail neck joint. Mm -hmm. So that wouldn't be the same joint that you saw working in the previous. Now, what he's working on over there, I'm not sure what guitar that that is. That's obviously something pretty, pretty ornate. So that's going to be. Definitely one where a lot of that prefit's going to come in play, mm -hmm. especially because of that pearl down around the fingerboard. Yeah. So this isn't an easy operation, but he'll get this one in. But that one over there is really going to require a lot of going back and forth. Now, hopefully, sure. the uh, the pre sanding operation, the prefit operation would. Uh, so still lots of just making sure neck straight. Yeah. Yep. Well, look at that. They were just yep. checking fret yep. heights, I guess here, yep. and well, he's going to check relief for sure. Because remember, he's got to prep it to go into the Plex machine, so that right. has to be right so to the Plex. So there's like Plec. a combination yep. Of, yep. of tasks here. Yep. And he's not really setting it up for playing as much as it is getting it ready for the Plex mm. machine to do Look what how, it needs to do on the frets and the saddle. Look how tight that went yep. in, just like, boom. If you look at it, there's compound angles on it. Mm. So the more you drive it in, the tighter it actually pushes yeah. it against the joint. Yeah. We really like that, that to be in there. I mean, theoretically, you know, if he wouldn't glue that, it really shouldn't even come out anyway. Well, that's, that's, that's almost what I, is, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm, I guess, it, you know, over time you need the glue in there, right? Yep. But, but it does look pretty tight even without. Yep. You know, I love, you see him check and drop. Yeah. You know. And I love all these little kind of, like you say, the tools that have obviously yep. been made over time that are yeah. completely unique for guitar building. And then if you look, you see how all these patterns are numbered? You keep track yep. of these patterns. You don't want a pattern to make its way out on the floor. It wears down. Mm -hmm. So remember, Lee, like in the 50s, when you see the rounded headstock, yep. that's a pattern wearing down. Right. So in right. order to prevent that, our quality assurance department knows where so, every one of these patterns so are. So we're scraping finish off here or still trying to get... Um, yeah, he's, he's just doing two a, a things. He, surface. He's both. He's getting whatever finish is on there or dirt, but at the same time, just tooth planing it to really get that glue in there yeah. and bite it. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is obviously not a hide glue as such. This no, is a, no, this would be yep. just like a, white a glue, yeah. Um. Double clamp. Yeah. Now we got to get that in there. And remember what I said. It's 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 really not easy to drive it down. Once you get yeah. the neck in there, it's really pushing up against that that front block. That's fantastic. Yep. And then uh, what? A few hours drying time for this. Probably not that long, is it? How long time? you let that dry? Uh, I think it's less than that. Yeah. Oh, is that a 45 minutes with a max of like two hours. Right. That way there's no indentations left behind from any of our calls or clamps. Oh, that's interesting. So it's yep. not just, it's a common, it's not too, not just too little drying time, it's too much drying time. Hey, wood time. compresses, Lee, yeah. you know what I mean? So right. again, look at the material he's using for his call. The call yeah, is yeah. that white piece there. Yeah. Again, if we use something, I think we did actually use aluminum at one point and then we moved over to wood. Yeah. But then wood obviously wears away over yeah. time. So we use another material for that. Let's head off to final assembly. So basically we're on the other side of the finishing department. Mm -hmm. We came through on that side. So we're kind of taking a, a path up to uh, final inspection. Yeah. This is also interesting too, Lee. So it's not really great. We can't really go in here, Lee. This is like a machining area, but you kind of get the idea that this is quite large. There's two floors of it and they make tools for the people they just on make the, the floor. Tools. We're very particular about tool making and patterns. That's really what helps mm. us keep 
consistent quality, consistent geometry. And the good part of it is a lot of these guys have been here sometimes yeah. 30, 40 years. They only make tools for guitar makers. We don't want to outsource what we need mm. to a machine shop who works on automotive and then guitars. <laughs> Each one of these folks also knows the people on the floor. So if the people on the floor need a tool or need something fixed or have an idea for a new tool, they can get together and we can manufacture it in here. And that not only is it tools, but it's also a lot of the fixturing, different things people use, like even the stands yep. that we put the guitars on and even our string winding machines. Mm -hmm. Martin, we, they, those guys can actually make their own string winding machines. We have seven generations of different uh, versions of that. And then obviously we're in final inspection right now, Lee. You see the Pleck machines, they have been amazing in keeping our, uh, our setups where yeah. they need to be. Every, like 98% of what we make goes through the Pleck machine. Once it comes through there, comes over here to final inspection. We're towards the end of the day, so it's a little slow at the moment, but how this works is these operators here are gonna get the guitars, they're gonna do a, a install the electronics, they're gonna put the pickguard on, strings, They'll give it a full inspection. If it's good enough, they'll come over, they'll sign off on it here. We'll go back for, for I think it's three days, 72 hours right now, and that will allow the guitar to move. So you're talking 180 pounds of string tension on standard tuning, so. So, so an inspection right as it's finished, and then three days, and then yep, another inspection. Then another re-inspection. Yeah, that's great. Yep. That's, that's important, isn't it? And I mean, we try to get different operators too to, to do mm. the inspections for two different sets of eyes. Mm. But once it's been three days, it's uh, signed off, goes to the warehouse and gets shipped out to places like Anderton's. That's amazing. Yep. Well, I mean, we could go through to the shipping department, I guess, and all that kind of stuff. But really, I suppose the interesting bit of seeing, you know, that final assembly and, you know, you might see around us people putting the electronics in and bits and bobs, but this is really sort of the end yep. of the guitar's journey here. That's right. Before it goes into the big bad world and starts yep. what its purpose was supposed to be. That's right. Just to make cool music. Um, Carmen, it's been an absolute education wandering around with you. A pleasure in education. Thanks to Ramin as well and all the other people that have stopped and said hi. Um, it's a, I, I, you know, it's a, it's an impressive, impressive operation. And again, I think it's been, you know, if you've, well done if you've watched all the footage of us in the USA, but I get to the end of each of these things with a sense of admiration and awe at um, just how much effort is going in to make these guitars that I think sometimes you walk into a store and you see a hundred guitars hanging up, you take it all for granted. But, you know, I have a newfound appreciation, I think, now for just like what it actually takes to put those guitars on the shelves. So, thank you very much All for right, showing us around. thanks, Lee. Thanks for stopping in Nazareth. And thank you for watching. See you next time. Okay, before you go, I'm with Matt now. He's another one of the directors at Martin Guitars. Uh, and they wanted to show us uh, their distribution center before we go. So we've driven about five minutes from the main office. I mentioned where they kept the wood as being like, the Indiana Jones storage area. <laughs> it's like, Matt's gone, hold my beer. I'll show you a storage area. So what goes on here? So this is, I think, more than just a distribution center for us. Our old facility, really, we were always kind of not having enough space for what we need to do with the volume guitars coming out of our Nazareth facility and, of course, from our Mexico facility as well. So this is beyond a distribution center. Obviously, all incoming and outgoing shipments. We also store our wood here. We store our cases. This gave us the ability to really have the space that we need mm. for our operations just beyond distribution. Yeah. I mean, it... Yeah, I, I, in my head it's like, pfft, but of course then you realize you're storing all the stuff you make in Mexico here before yep. it goes out. Um, I mean, obviously the scale is impressive, but I guess whilst we're here, we can see some wood. We, uh, we love gonna, seeing wood. Yep, yep. And there's, we're going to get to my uh, area that is one of my favorite parts. So I happen to be the project manager. I introduced our new warehouse management system uh, that really gave us better efficiency for picking and packing. Uh, and I was also the project manager for moving us into this building, consolidating our old uh, storage facilities and getting this up and running. And it is exciting. Let's do it. Cool. So I, one of the biggest things, and even our contractors, uh, they had said that this kind of mezzanine mm -hmm. in a warehouse was very unique to us. But right. that's just 
Martin. But that's how, to be honest, so our distribution centre in Guildford, so we, we're not at this scale, but we've got about 70,000 square feet, something like that. We probably go up about six metres, so you you go up higher. But putting the mezzanine, because most of what you want to store is shelf storage exactly. rather than pallet storage yep. in guitars, we did the mezzanines as well, the two floors of mezzanine. And otherwise it's just dead space, isn't it's it? It's dead space. Or for straight vertical racking to get, say, mm. a single guitar down off the shelf, you're on a machine, you're going up, you're getting mm. it down. With this, with the mezzanine, basically every guitar is at yep. pickable level just yep. from the floor. Yep. So right away it increases efficiency because you're not having to go up and down. Yep. Obviously we want to get the guitars out yep. in the order that they came in. Yep. So this setup really is, is great for us. I'll introduce you to Chris at our place. You can nerd out about warehouse management systems and software that picks all the right <laughs> guitars at the right time. You'd love it. I do love it. Yeah. Total, I'm a total nerd for a high functioning system. So uh, one of the big changes with our warehouse management system was getting away from paper-based yep. stuff. It's yep. really all driven by um, electronic Scanners, yeah. uh, inventory, picking, packing, everything is really done through a single unit. It's, it's, honestly, it's genuinely not dissimilar. It's, it's like a bigger version of Anderton's. So mm -hmm. same, we've got the same packing stations, the guns. Yep. They're all working on the, the software system we put in over time starts to work out what your popular items are. Yep. So they then get stored nearer the packing stations. Yep. And we, um, and we set things up in here. Obviously, when you're packing, you want to make a mm, pyramid, right? Mm -hmm. Largest on the bottom. And that's why we have number one cartons, which is going to be Road Series or X or Nazareth product. And then it kind of goes down to ukulele. Yeah. So I suppose the big difference, our average order is one or two items. Yeah. So we probably don't have that same challenge of having to put the, the pallets together. Um, whereas <laughs> yep. I'm guessing this is this is a typical size this order for a distributor. This is absolutely a typical yeah, we container We don't have many size. customers that place orders this big with yep. us. Uh, be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> and this is and the space that we have now compared to what we have in the past, we can stage outgoing shipments. So rather than getting everything packed back into the rackings, we can get everything prepped right here to go out. I suppose we're not going to see an Anderson's palette here. Right? We're just going to see maybe a West Side palette. Yep. My God, it's enormous. Yep. So as I it's had mentioned, vast. it's really just beyond. Oh, I've just realized, and this is now wood storage this here, isn't it? This is all wood it? storage here, yep. So uh, we, can, we can check it out. I was, I'd always spot check when we first moved in here. I wonder if there's no trees left in the world. They're all in here. <laughs> yeah. So this entire facility, because we store finished goods, we store raw materials, this entire facility is basically acclimated perfectly for our products mm. and for our raw materials. Um, like I had said earlier, right, this is all stickered wood. This is facilities beyond just distribution for us. Mm. So the consolidation of the buildings and being able to store things from raw to finished really gives us a, a, a lot better efficiency for back and forth from the factory. I mean, it's just mind blowing, isn't it? It's mind blowing. Now, I do, mean, what do you do with the, so the, does the wood for Mexico go direct there or is it stored here and then shipped down there? It's a, it depends on what it is. There's a lot of wood that will come here for processing and sorting, grading, yeah. and then it will be sent down on the southbound truck. There are some uh, stuff that's sent directly to Mexico. It just depends on um, support and the needs and the overall supply chain for our wood sourcing. Now, this is, this is cool, but we're not... What, what do you think? So, Matt, by the way, is Chris Martin's nephew. Yep. So what do you think your great-great-grandfather, I don't even know what the relation would be, what do you think he would say I if think, he could see I don't this? think he'd say anything. Really? I think it would be so surreal that he would be speechless. Yeah. I, I honestly do. I mean, from the thought of the homestead and the shop to even the size mm. of the factory now, just the pure volume of instruments that we produce in a year would probably be mind-blowing to him. And then this facility would just be the, the icing we, on the we cake. We had a similar... I, um, interviewed my uh, grandmother about two or three years before she died for our 50th anniversary and she was telling stories about how much money they took on the first day that the shop opened yeah and you're going and, and it was like whatever it was a few pounds and then I would tell her like how much money we do in an average day now sure you know and it's just like it, it's, it's, it's like you say it's, it's just a it's just a it's just a number that can't even it's not like Can't they go, fathom. oh, wow, that's cool. Yeah. It's, just, it's just like... Pfft. They're hand-making yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, a few and, dozen and instruments exactly. a year, and, yeah. and we are producing a volume now that would just be mind-boggling yeah. for them. Yeah. yeah. So 
this is obviously very cool, but the next room is really there's another room. my favorite aspect. Of course, my there's another room. part of this building. <laughs> it just never ends. And the total square footage for us here is about 300. We currently occupy 200,000. We have a wall in this side, but there's actually another side to the DC that when we continue to grow and expand, uh, we'll have more room. <laughs> I think it, I th oh. slightly off camera here, I think I will compare what we pay rent per square foot in Guildford compared to what you pay rent per square foot here. I'm gonna put my money on it that we pay a lot more per square foot <laughs> than you do. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like, this is insane. So we walk and the lights will kick on. But, you know, when we first started the project, we looked at a lot of other distribution centers and it really just kind of came true to form that there wasn't a building that was already built to, to satisfy our needs. We're a unique business. Uh, we obviously have unique processes from manufacturing to distribution and storage. So we had to build a building that was for us and specifically for what we do. Oh, you've got lots of cases and stuff yep, up there? Yep, this is or? all gig bags, gig bags uh, and just cases. for supporting production. Yeah. Uh, we obviously want to strategically purchase anything and avoid stock out and potential manufacturing issues. Um, but this, this room alone just has been so nice for us. The ability that you can literally back in an entire tractor trailer mm. right in here. I saw your load. own Martin mm -hmm. sign written yep. lorry as well. That looked yep. cool. Those box trucks are the ones that uh, transport the instruments back and forth from Nazareth. This was when I was, when we were over here doing the project, this was like my quiet place. Mm. Nice and comfortable, nice and cool. I could come here and think, not hear all the machinery running. You could probably fit every other acoustic manufacturer in the world <laughs> in your distribution center. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah, the cantilever racking too really makes this a, a very accessible setup. So instead of just dead pile stacks, you can get any stack of wood out really at any time. Wow. Lot, lots of mahogany it, over here. Yep, it's, it, it's a bit, it, again, I, it's nice to have seen the whole factory because it would be easy to see this and just be sort of overwhelmed by the scale of everything. But to know that there's still then somebody scraping the paint off the bind, you know, it's like doing the most minuscule task. Um, yeah, it's just, a, it's, it's quite a, but it's just, it is important, I think, that we've seen that in the video. Otherwise, you would just see this and you just think it's some enormous conglomerate yeah. that's just yep. burning through a thousand tons of wood a week. Nope. But there's still, it still ultimately ends up with a team of highly skilled yeah. people to make the guitars, doesn't it? I mean, that's it. Mm. We see raw materials, we see finished goods, but the people that are involved in our operation are, I mean, always going to be our greatest asset. You get to drive all the trucks and everything like that. I am, no one's I am actually forklift you, certified, you are forklift and certified. I have driven just about everything in this room. <sighs> Tremendous. Yeah. Actually, about this time, we're having a, a like a demolition derby. Yeah, this is yeah, a yeah, basketball ball, match yeah. or football. When, this, when the building yeah. was completely empty, like the thought of getting like go karts or something, they're around we did, in here. We our did legal and safety our, teams obviously weren't too we, enthused. We, we did it in, for our uh, when we had the warehouse completed and it wasn't uh, full we would take like a 100 watt marshall stack and just put it in the middle just just let it see rip. what it does yeah yeah absolutely yeah. epic reverb basically yeah okay cool Done? i have if i if you guys give me two minutes mm -hmm. i'm gonna go grab my i have to get my other set of keys out of my car i left them um we can check out one other cool thing i have a really cool guitar to show you guys and then we can finish there so this place is just i'm lost already um, we've come around a corner. And there's like a caged off um, section of racking here, full of cases, some sort of wrapped in polythene and stuff. Um, these are all prototype models that Martin have made over the years. Things that obviously, you know, are unique, but maybe no, you know, not the sort of thing they'd put in the museum. Although uh, Carmen was saying some of this stuff does periodically go in the museum. But I mean, look at the size, the scale. Look at this. There is a chrome Martin arch top in there. 
I mean, why would they, maybe an artist wanted that once, or I don't know, maybe they were thinking that was going to be the next big thing. Chrome Martin arch tops. Arch backs, arch, I mean, again, I mean, maybe Martin don't want us filming what their prototyping was, I don't know. You can see just from some of these cases, these go way back. I wonder if these were destined for the museum at some point. We're like, we want to send it to the state, right? Look at this, I mean, I don't know, again, I'm speechless. The, the, oh, that was the other thing I was saying, is, is it, you, you'd be forgiven for thinking with an operation this size that that Martin factory must be making like 10,000 guitars a day, but they're not, they're making about 200 guitars a day. So you just think, you've got enough raw materials here to probably last you 100 years. It's just insane. What do you say, Tay? Have you ever seen anything like it? Look how high up they go up there. Man. I guess it's what you get if you uh, run a guitar company for 190 years and it's really successful. You end up with this. Oh, crazy. I was just saying to, to Matt, I mean, the, we talked about um, cases made by coffin makers earlier on. You can see that, right? Yeah. So what was the reveal? So I guess I'll set this up. You'd asked me what, how would Chris's great, great grandfather think? And I, you know, I, first and foremost, I hope that they would be proud. Mm -hmm. And I hope that they would recognize that we still continue to honor the traditions that CF Senior put in place for how we think about quality, how we think about building our acoustic guitars, and what kind of purpose they serve mm -hmm. in the greater world, right? Music's all about self-expression, and we build a product that yeah. helps people express themselves yeah. through music and art. And keeping our history and, and understanding, I think it was Isaac Asimov, he said, if I've seen further than other men, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I am, standing on the shoulders of giants. So this whole cage here was really um, preservation of all of our museum pieces. We build new uh, models and we keep a prototype for, for posterity. Mm -hmm. um, and any really special guitar that comes into our position, this is really its home. Stuff comes in and out of the museum. And we have pieces going back to our origins. And that's this piece, I think, really is a good summation of, of our history. So this is a, obviously a Stauffer style instrument from 1834. What's really unique about this instrument in particular is that it was partially built in Germany. Right. And came over on the schooner with the family and was finished being built in New York City. So why wouldn't you have this in the museum then? Um, there's another 1833 one over right. there. I think that's... Because <laughs> we've got two. <laughs> and this one, I think this one actually, you can tell that repairs were done. Uh, this one actually had been rebuilt. I think the one in the museum um, is probably still in its, its traditional original form. Um, we obviously with bird's eye maple veneer. And I think our guess was that the core wood is Brazilian. Don't you love the fact that even <laughs> 200 years later, we kind of, you know, we're still into bird's eye maple. And yeah, absolutely. And so you're saying, you think underneath the veneer is probably Brazilian, Brazilian. rosewood? Yeah, I think so. Which, I mean, that's my core wood of choice for sure, mm. for any veneer. Um, but, you know, that thought about what we're capable now, producing guitars, still mm. with an incredible attention to detail and quality, the thought of doing this by hand, by candlelight is, like is... Early Disney stuff here, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's like <laughs> basically Mickey Mouse ears all the way around the... <laughs> and the thought of this, I mean, the, the detail and the quality that they could achieve back then with really some very simplicity in, in mm. tools is still something that will never I'm, I'm, stop blowing my mind. I'm kind of jealous of the fact that, you know, you, you're holding something that one of your forefathers kind of just made themselves yep. you know it's like i mean i think we'd all love mementos of yeah. you know f you know generations gone past but it's just oh, that's incredible can, and I, the, can oh, I hold it please and the museum and here i think it's always important for us to continue to reflect on our history and and why we're so renowned as as really the premier 
acoustic guitar builder in the world. I slap some EMGs on it, maybe put a Floyd uh, on it, yeah. Yeah, something like that. I tone <laughs> volume right through the top. It could do with a tuner. <laughs> Auto tuners. Yeah, robot tuners, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing that I always love. So whenever you see a style for a headstock with this really ornate, mm. this mechanism itself typically could have been half the cost of the total instrument. Mm. So you see 1,800 pieces. If you saw friction pegs, um, you know that they were probably trying to have some other higher end attributes because that really s represented a significant cost. Um, the transition away from that really just had to deal with supply chain and inability to kind of get them sourced from Germany. I just, can you imagine being let loose in here? Given the keys, <laughs> just going, I'll see you in a month. You know, it's just like. It's endless. And, I would, and I'd just I, sleep on the floor down here yeah. and as long as I could, you know, get pizza delivered every day, I'd just live here. <laughs> and this is, uh, you know, the one thing that's cool about being 190 years old is there's an endless amount of history still to be learned about what our do business. You, I mean, I was saying to Carmen, but it's probably even more appropriate to you, you know, 2033 has got to be on your mind, hasn't it now? And yeah. just thinking, you know, the 200 year celebration is gonna be insane. So you guys saw the 2.5 million, yeah. right? So from like ideation to execution, that was about four years. Yeah. So thinking about the 200 year mark, that's a real. We thing, should probably right? start be thinking about it. Will now. you invite us to the party? <laughs> yeah. Excellent stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> it's insane. Little man, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you very Absolutely. much. I've said that about a hundred times today to all the different people that we've met, haven't no, we? But smiling. it's it. I can't. It's just like what. It's well, just a dream job, isn't it? I think Carmen and I know that we're very fortunate and lucky where we get to work and what we get to do, and 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 getting to share that with others, especially. Yeah. Great dealers across the pond or something I'm always excited to do. Brilliant. There we go. I'm pretty sure this is absolutely 100% categorically the final goodbye of our trip to the East Coast of America. It's an amazing uh, way to, to, to sign out. We're jumping on a plane tomorrow. We'll be back in the UK soon. But yes, thank you so much for everyone who's looked after us. Thank you for watching hours of footage. Well done to Tay and Pete as well for... <laughs> All the sterling work they do, but that's it. I'm signing out, I promise, for the last time. See ya, goodbye. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye, Martin. Mm -hmm.